Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. You have trouble, you can't stop and you want help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey everybody, welcome to another Ask Dr. Drew. We are so grateful to be able to be here with you today. The phone number, of course, 984-2-DR-DREW or 984-237-3739. Coming up, I have a bunch of special uh, callers, people from my KBC radio world, where at the end of the month we will be Parting company, uh, no hard feelings at all. It's been six great years there, and uh, so some of the people are going to go that we've been. I've had the pleasure to work with over the years. Going to call in and say hello and goodbye. So we'll have that. Of course, we'll have your calls in just a minute. I'll be introducing my guest. Uh, she has a lot to say as well. She has spent a lot of time talking about the explosion of mentally ill living on the streets of America's big cities. She also is a social scientist, writer, researcher, model, influencer. She has promoted the legalization of cannabis and MDMA, MDMA for veterans. That got her fired from a journalist job mag- as, as a magazine editor, but she also was awarded specialist visas by both the Obama and Trump administrations. She is here to talk about that and more. I'll tell you about her more in just a second. I want to give a special shout-out to Spore 2002, We really appreciate you having been the moderator of the Dr. Drew subreddit, Spore. Thank you. I noticed some very kind words by you and others saying that you were saying about this particular show. So I want to thank you all for listening, and I want to thank uh, all the people on the subreddit. Are we having a technical problem? Spore 2012. What did I say? Spore 2002. 2002. I beg your pardon. Spore 2012. Okay. (laughs) So, see, that's called... That's called persuasion spore. If you make a mistake and then you go back, people make note of that. So spore 2012 is a, a number, that, a name and a, and a screen name that no one will ever forget. Also a reminder, our next live show will be January 2020, so be sure to sign up at drdrew.tv. You'll get a message like you did today if you already signed up when we are streaming again. You can sign up by email, but the best option is to sign up with your phone number because those alerts are quick and easy. No worries about spam. The phone alerts are only letting you know that we're taking your calls. We're not going to bother you beyond that. And we're already getting a lot of great calls, so I will try to get to all you guys. Uh, let's see. What else do I have to tell you? Oh, uh, Ask Dr. Drew is also now available as a podcast, so subscribe. And, of course, all the other pods at uh, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen. And one more time, that number, 8984-237-3739. Now, let me give you the more complete intro to my guest, Kay Smythe. She is an internationally practicing writer, socio-demographic research specialist, and awarded consecutive visas under the Obama administration. You can tell me what kind those are. What's a zero one visa? It's a, an O one. It's a specialist visa. Um, it's usually reserved. you're an asset, in other words. Yeah, yeah. You're I mean, my second I Russian so. asset that I've spoken to on this program. We had we had Papadopoulos's wife last week, and uh, if I had to cast a Russian asset, <laughs> she'd be that. You'd be my mi six mi sixteen. Oh yeah, definitely. You'd be my mi sixteen cast. So there Definite. you go. Kay is best known for tackling stigmatizing behaviors in human capital, like cannabis nudity gangs. Her work has evolved into an amalgamation of policy changing actions and data based on human behavior trend forecast. That's why I want Kay here, and that's why I'm delighted to be able to, interf- to, to discuss this. All so much is going on in our country that we pretend isn't. Uh, so one of the reasons I, you caught my attention is you tagged me on a Twitter feed where you were talking about homelessness. Mm-hmm. You wrote a little article about the holidays, right? Yeah, you know, just how wonderful it is to come to Los Angeles and, you know, go down to the beach and go swimming amongst the needles (laughs) and, you know, the plague and God knows what else. Right. Yeah, it's a wonderful place to be during the holidays with, like, no policing either and the wildfires and, oh, it's just great. It's It's awesome. And you've been here how long? Uh, Since 2015, I, like, started coming out here to see if it was where I wanted to be, and then in 2016, I got my first visa. So you've been in the Southern California, Los Angeles area for three years, give or take, right? Yeah. And in those three years, you seem to have gained insight into what's going on here well beyond politicians that have lived there their whole life. 
What? Why are you have magical insight into what's happening here? I, I don't. I think they see it too. They just get paid not to see it. So they have no motivation to go uh, outside their front door and deal with their constituents and mitigate I, I this can't. issue when they're making so much money from it. So that's the so-called homeless industrial complex, right? Yeah. So this is ways of, of selling the, the public on these tremendously expensive single person units yeah that cost like seven hundred thousand dollars right that we'll get to, we'll get con- yeah we'll get converted to condos yeah. soon enough for oh, the developers no that, problem that I, if, if a homeless person ends up in any of these buildings i will eat all of my words if right. the buildings get built at all well i i'm certainly some of the transient homeless may get in there right which is oh, yeah which is not the population we're concerned with mm-hmm. we're concerned with the chronically homeless yes which are the drug addicted, mm-hmm. mentally ill on our streets, which yeah. you, you see fairly clearly as a social scientist researcher. Well, I think it's also the fact that, you know, when they're having a bad day, they tend to chase people down the street too. I think you can't, it's not something you can avoid seeing. Um, I don't think I'm alone in the fact that, you know, like I've been followed home several times. I've been assaulted. I have all of my friends in this town have dealt with an issue with a mentally ill homeless person in some way, shape or form, or like a criminal homeless person in some way, shape or form. And those are the issues that I think uh, are being ignored that are going to be to our detriment. And that's why I wrote the article because it's, you know, there's like three people dying a day, I think it is. In Los Angeles County. Yeah, and that's Los Angeles County alone. That's not even all of California. Or or Washington, Oregon, they have a similar problem. It's a genocide. It's a genocide and it's happening on our streets. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, I could not have said that better. It, it's a, a genocide on the streets of mm-hmm. Southern California. Yeah. And that's why I have trouble believing the politicians know what's going on. I, I, I understand they're paid not to see it. And mm-hmm. so they're, it's, it's sort of motivated thinking, right? It's cognitive distortion. I get that. Yeah. But to not wake up every day and go, three people are going to die on my watch. What do I need to do about that? I, I as a clinician can't live with it. I don't understand how they do. I mean, I don't know whether it's a case of just like these inherent unconscious biases where, because I see like even the people that I watch that I learn from who are in my kind of demographic, they go on television shows to talk about this issue too. And even they're prevaricating about it being a housing crisis. So I don't know if it's just like these people are being so indoctrinated into truly believing it's a housing crisis that they are just completely numb to it at this point, or if it is just they're making so much money. Uh, I mean, at this level, they're not going to get like reelected if they come out and say what's actually going on. I mean, actually, ironically, they might if things go well over the next t- uh, two years. Right, as the public kind of wakes up to what's actually going on here, right? Well, yeah. Um, so. We've all been kind of victims of this uh, of this propaganda, and I don't know whether it's just kind of leeching into the political elite too. But uh, again, I found that very hard to believe, <laughs> just I, personally. I, I do too. Uh, we have a bunch of calls coming in. I'm trying to get, we're going to be chatting a little bit more about this particular problem. I also want to talk to Kay mm-hmm. about the your other sort of uh, ish, passionate issues like drug legalization. Mm-hmm. Give us a, we, we have to go to break in a minute, but give me a little primer on that too. Um, so despite the fact that I am for decriminalization, full decriminalization of all drugs, I'm actually for the full legalization of the whole bloody lot. Like it would be great if we just legalized all drugs, made it a legitimate industry. And I'm going to interrupt you and say, is that, that based on the idea that prohibition only fuels black market. Black oh, market exactly. does, not, does not really affect the individuals using it. Affects a black market. Exactly. Okay. I, I. This is going to sound really cold and blunt, but people who are addicted to dangerous substances, that addiction is always going to exist. Right. It would be great if we could legalize all these drugs, use that tax revenue to set up harm prevention interventions in general, set up like decent education systems to teach people about the realities. Yeah, of drug and I use. kept saying that about cannabis, and yeah, here we are in California. We've legalized it, and I don't see any revenue coming to the the help people with substance issues. It doesn't seem to. I, I don't know that I trust the government to do that. That's one of my concerns. Well, like this is why I trust decriminalization. Like I am a huge proponent of decriminalization across Europe because we have the social knowledge, the social capital, and the social systems in place to do that. I mean, we don't even have a healthcare system in America. Like everyone keeps talking about healthcare as if it's a thing that exists. Right. Okay. So we'll talk. We'll talk yeah. about this because so you're you're talking about what to do if there was legalization. Mm-hmm. Most European countries already have something in place to manage that. Yeah. 
and we have nothing to manage that. Nothing at all. Well, we could. We could do it. We just pretend we don't need to or something. Yeah. I, I don't know what that is. You're from Wales. Mm -hmm. Did you grow up there? Uh, yes. And you went to college? In Plymouth in the UK, in England. A and yeah. what was your training in? I did. My undergraduate degree was a geography degree. So I didn't even split of human and physical geography because the idea was that there would be green jobs to go into after graduation. Um, they do not exist. So um, I specialized at the end in um, human geography, looking at uh, recreational drug use versus problem drug use. So uh, it's kind of an epidemiology degree. Yeah, I would say it's far more sociological. Like by the end, it was very sociological. Okay, yeah. Which is why you were able to look at the streets of Los Angeles and draw some conclusions. Oh, yeah. I Easily. mean, like, Just as a researcher's eye, you look oh. at the data and... Pretty simple. Knee-jerk reaction. You right. just walk outside and go, <gasps> okay, <Yeah. laughs> <Got> <laughs> I'm going to deal with this. All right, we got to take a little break. Uh, we are lining up your calls actively. Again, the number uh, the number is 984-2-DR-DUR or 984-237-3739. We will talk more to Kate. We will get your calls after this. The CBD industry is still pretty much the Wild West. When it comes to claims and criticisms, the science is catching up with the industry. We will have clinical science soon enough, and there seems to be an overwhelmingly positive response these days to CBD's efficacy. We've all heard the reports, and luckily our good friends at Social CBD are raising the industry testing standards. They like to say they are test-obsessed. Social CBD works closely with their suppliers and multiple third-party labs to ensure you are getting exactly the package that they say you are getting. High quality CBD with 0, 0.0 THC. And Social CBD wants you to be skeptical. That's why they put a QR and batch code on every package. This allows you to check all the test results for your product, not general testing, the product, the one, the specific batch you bought. And while Social CBD broad spectrum products are available in a range of formulations, each of which is clearly described so you can make an informed decision without all that hype and promises that sound too good to be true. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash social CBD. That is my website, drdrew.com slash S-O-C-I-A-L-C-B-D. For a limited time, you can save 20% at checkout with the code Dr. Drew. Now let's get back to the show. Needles have increasingly become a part of everyday life. Proper disposal is both difficult and expensive. We have the solution. Simpler, safer, affordable, and fulfills the obligation to protect our environment. A single stick with something like this means tracking down the user. It means blood tests for the person's stock. It means possibly medication for an extended period of time. Needle sticks are devastating. No more. Incinerate the needle. Needle goes in this port. It's over. Done. Needle gone. We all have loved ones who use needles. Keep their home safe. Medical offices are loaded with sharps. We are using ancient technology to protect our patients, our staff, ourselves. You know what needle sticks do. You know the cost and the devastation psychologically and physically potentially from a needle stick. Eliminate that completely. Stop using ancient technology. Sand MIDI. It will solve your problems. Find out more at NeedleDestructionDevice.com. In your professional opinion, what do you think of these gas station dick pills? At best, a waste of time. At worst, dangerous. What is the worst thing that, that could happen for them? Worst case, you could wind up dead. Do you ever say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something like this. I'm going to try this. <laughs> We are back with Kay Smythe, everybody. And uh, we're going to – we've got a bunch of things kind of lined up for you guys. It's, uh, but, but Kay and I are still talking about the things she is passionate about. One of the things before we go on, that, that needle thing, that's actually something I'm actively involved with. I, I've always had a vision my whole career that needles – we should find some kind of technology that just eliminates needles as a problem because mm -hmm. I, I, I sort of cut my teeth taking care of AIDS patients and then drug addicts and I just kept needles were always part of my problem and that that device I'm very excited about so if you if you have a if you're cleaning up streets if you are diabetic yourself take a look at that thing it makes needles not a biohazard and no possibility of a needle stick so 
That's why I'm excited about that. What do you think about needle exchanges? So I have no problem in principle with needle exchanges, right? Mm-hmm. I see. I'm you're you're coming from the perspective of harm avoidance, harm reduction, right? Well, that's generally what I'm used to from yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, right. And I I have no in principle problem with any of that. And the, to, when it can save lives, I'm actively for it. Mm-hmm. The problem is as an isolated policy, it's not right. You have to have a whole set of things around it to mm-hmm. make it worthwhile. Now, in this country, we don't do needle exchanges. We do needle giveaways. We just, you can oh. come and just, we don't, you don't have to exchange. You don't have to bring anything back. We just give you needles. Well, that's like completely counterproductive yes. to the whole Yes, Kay, point. yes. This, this is f- why you have, this is why I needed to invent a device like yeah. that because we have carpets of needles in this city and yeah. in San Francisco because we just do needle giveaways. Mm-hmm. Because, well, drug addicts, you can't expect them to bring their needles back. You know, they were that's not the way to treat a drug addict. Yeah. The way to treat a drug addict mm-hmm. go, hey, mm-hmm. well, I'll give you a needle. Get your ass back here with mm-hmm. the needles I gave you. Yeah. And next time, I maybe we'll have to do something else. Or next time, I'll have you arrested or so. You have, you have to motivate them. You have, yeah. to, you have to really be tough to mm-hmm. get because the, they're in the disease state. Yeah. Now, back to what you were saying about harm avoidance. You you were saying that you think we should legalize everything, right? Um. Yeah, I'm just uh, getting my notes up here. Go ahead. Get your notes, um, and I'll look at some more calls, too, and I'll get to this call in a second. Go ahead. Well, it's like, okay, so one of my biggest concerns about coming on today was, like, I really didn't want to come across as, you know, when you talk about drug decriminalization, yep. and I'm going to say I'm not for it in America, that makes me sound like a fascist, but I'm only not for it in America because the way that makes the policy has been... you sound like a socialist, actually. So, oh, really? Well, because then it's saying, well, my social welfare programs we have in Europe are superior. I mean... <laughs> they are. I, mean, I, so, like, I don't want to so. be like that guy, but I mean, I don't know how long they're going to be around like after the last election. Don't know how long these You're things... are like, Boris Johnson's election. Okay, yes. Yeah, 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 you know. But again, like the way that, um, say, a country like Portugal has gone about dealing with drug decriminalization they've had what like a 60 percent reduction in diseases like aids um like rates like i think there's one stat like rates of children trying drugs at like age 16 is higher but that's not a real stat that's just because kids now feel comfortable admitting to the fact that they're gonna try drugs at that age right because there's not the same stigma and consequences yeah so i'm blanking help me out you guys on the the guy's (laughs) name i'm going going to my crack producer uh he wrote a book about portugal oh um i shared the podium with him with uh, governor christie you could look at that you'll you'll see his name in a second anyway he was pointing at portugal but everyone always points at portugal mm-hmm. when you talk about drug legalization mm-hmm. and back when i was sharing the the stage with this gentleman you're going to you're going to find this in a second Emily, i'm sure the what's his name Chasing the no no now, uh, they f- they forget to mention that every other country on earth, no, every other country on earth takes care of its sick people. We do not. Mm-hmm. We we have decided that you are at your liberty to be sick until you die mm-hmm. if you have a brain disease, mm-hmm. unless it's dementia. Mm-hmm. Then we jump in. Yeah. So brain diseases that we cannot affect the course of, mm-hmm. we jump all over. Yeah. But brain diseases that we can dramatically affect the course of, particularly if we intervene early, hey, they're at their liberty to do that, man. Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't do that in this country. We let them have their schizophrenia until they devolve to the point that they're irretrievable. Mm-hmm. We let them have their drug addiction until, until they die. Mm-hmm. We have their bipolar disorder until they commit suicide. Mm-hmm. That's insane. No other country does that, right? Yeah, no okay. other country. So in Portugal, when they legalized everything, mm-hmm. they anticipated things like, if you wanted to do your heroin, mm-hmm. we will give you that heroin and we'll watch you, we'll have it, nurses administer it. Yep. So harm avoidance, which I have no problem giving heroin addicts heroin. Mm-hmm. I don't. If people don't want recovery, and by the way, there I've been very in favor of these alcoholic houses where people are allowed to go and drink as much as they want mm-hmm. because they have behavior enhancement specialists there. So you can get them and talk to them and develop a rapport with them while you're letting them practice their disease. But if they practice their disease unchecked, mm-hmm. what happens? You're, they, not, you're not a clinician. What happens? <laughs> they die. They die. They die. They die. And in this country, we let them die, period. That's just mm-hmm. the way it goes. And that that I cannot... I Now... You should know, even though I'm, I'm going along with your hypothesis about all this, I'm not fully there with you uh, because I worked, I don't know if you know, I've worked in this field for like 30 years. Mm-hmm. And, and so I saw the benefits of having certain axes to wield. 
it really helps people get well. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, you know, it does. It yeah. really does. And if you take away all those motivating kinds mm-hmm. of uh, leverages, mm-hmm. it's okay. I mean, if we if we just say that's what we're going to do, I, I, I'm not going to – it's better than this, what we're doing now, which is nothing. Yeah. I would prefer personally some sort of intermediate sort of something. And I agree. So the way that we're taught about drugs in the UK, I think is a great example of how to teach people about drugs. Um, It was the most, um, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? It was liberal in the sense that it was honest. So I I actually had a drugs uh, counselor come in and speak to my entire year group. And we had this every year from age, I think, 10 through 16. You get the same class every year, do the same thing with uh, comprehensive sex education, where we're taught, hey, if you're going to go out and say, use ecstasy, don't drink too much water when you go out because you can actually drown from doing that. So do you know what? When so we it's go not drown, out, you get your brain swelling. Yeah, and you I die. mean, we were told. Drown, yeah, we were told like we were drowned. It's just like, oh my god, yeah. like that's terrifying. Yeah. And so we're taught about drugs in a way to almost respect them to the point mm-hmm. of them only being appropriate when recreational. And then when people bridge into that problem drug use, it's immediately recognizable. Like out here, people seem to. Th- think that their opinion on what constitutes like problem versus recreational drug use dictates what it actually is. And it's a very personal opinion. Yeah, I know. (laughs) As opposed to a clinical threshold. Yeah, I could talk about that all day. Johan um, Hari. Johan Hari. Emily, you got it. Johan Hari is the guy I was thinking of. Okay. Who who wrote a couple books. Maybe you can pull those out for me even. And uh, Mm -hmm. he points at Portugal and some of these other... he, He does not understand addiction at all. He's not factually incorrect he's actually factually correct Mm -hmm. but he doesn't contextualize what he's deriving properly you're 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 filling out the whole story i mean we need stigma like there has to be a stigma attached to doing heroin to doing meth to doing these drugs i'm not sure in the sense of oh god this is a bad thing this person that i love is doing it bad yeah like bad dangerous gonna kill you and and i would argue that we have to start distinguishing between somebody with an addiction and, and the behaviors that result from addiction. Yes. And we should stigmatize those behaviors, mm-hmm. but not stigmatize the drug addict per se. Well, when they're in those behaviors, yes, but not the drug addiction per se. And I think this is maybe like, uh, I don't know if it's like a cultural thing, but like when I say stigmatize, like if I came home and found that like I had a family member who was heavily addicted to heroin, tough love. Mm-hmm. That's what it means for me. It's it's coming from a place of like, I love you unconditionally, I don't want you to die. We're not going to do this. So I'm going to be mad at you until you fix yourself. And I agree there should be a certain amount of stick uh, as much as there is carrot in that kind of right. treatment. Exactly. Yeah. That's you what got, I mean. You got it. Stigma. You need both. Here, let's go to this. Going to go to anxiety question. This is Alyssa. Thanks for calling in and thanks for signing up at drdrew.tv. What do you got? Uh oh. Hey. There you um, are. I was listening. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was listening to the Adam and Dr. Drew show and Adam was talking about how um, you experienced anxiety once when you guys were about to go on stage and he forced you to go back out on stage. Um, anyway, <laughs> you kind of worked through it. Um, but my question is, is do you deal with the anxiety or the thought of having anxiety attacks still yeah. And if so, how do you deal with them? Because that is where yeah. my anxiety stems from, is just worrying about having those attacks again yes, and trying to figure out how to deal with that. I am going to recommend a book to you, if I can find it very quickly, that uh, helped uh, Chelsea from Teen Mom, who had the exact same syndrome. It is called Dare, A New Way to End Anxiety and Panic Attacks by Barry McDonough. Dare by Barry McDonough. Okay? You got that? Okay, and yep. and that's when I was having panic attacks for real. When I was like nineteen, twenty, and I was having disabling panic attacks, and I was depressed, and I had horrible generalized anxiety. Then I was living in constant fear of them because they were just paralytic. I couldn't function with them, and so just you know the way panic works, mm-hmm. the fear of the panic feeds on itself sometimes. So it's panic about the panic that gets you really into a serious spiral. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why that book. That's why that book Dare is very good. In the particular episode you're talking about with me and Adam, I had just had a fight with John Favreau on the air, like a huge fight, because he was. Uh, <laughs> he was about. It was on Love Line and MTV back in the day, and we were filming this episode, and a schizophrenic called in, 
who was actively psychotic and really struggling. And Favreau goes, don't let anybody tell you to take those medications. That's all doctors trying to make money. And I went like, hold, hold, hold on. You're talking to a very, very sick person. Do not do And we got into, like, it got almost got, like, in each other's faces a bit. Because I, I can't tolerate that. I can't tolerate when people let sick people get mm-hmm. become endangered. And so... Yeah, we had a big absolutely. fight. We had a big fight, and uh, and then the next show, we were just doing back to back shows in those days. The next show, I came out on stage, and I was upset, and I was upset, and all of a sudden, I started having a panic attack, and I just said, "I, I got to take a minute." And Adam came into my dress room and goes, "Get your ass back out there! If I have to spend one more minute here, I'm going to kick your <laughs> ass." <laughs> and uh, he goes, "You're going to, you're fine. You can deal with it." And I did deal with it. So that's the sort of dare technique. Now, now to be fair, that was you know. Compared to my old panic attacks, that was not a bad one, and I could kind of push through it. I just wasn't very effective <laughs> on camera, which I didn't, I didn't like being. And he was like, "I'm going to cover you. Get out. We got to. I'm going home for dinner. Let's get out of here." <laughs> so that's what that was all about. But um, the other thing, gotcha. was, yeah, the other thing is I was uh, mismanaged too. I I did not get the proper medication or psychotherapy that I should have gotten. It really wasn't until years later that I got more co- comprehensive psychological services and uh, they went away and so mm-hmm. treatment works done properly oh, okay mm-hmm. okay you ever had panic uh okay. nerves crippling nerves i don't know if it's the same kind of thing different like, different different kind of but thing. like anticipatory nerves like coming on a show like this oh or? yeah absolutely um i've never had like the full-on anxiety depression definitely but anxiety has been the one thing that i've slowly managed to avoid i think it's just my ego though interesting at this point. yeah so uh Chase, yeah. What's that? Say, say that out loud. Hari. Oh, Yokan Hari. Yeah. That wasn't the book that uh, no. So he's like, the books that he was some book about. I can't remember. It was like something about the ghost. Anyway, mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. want to get me off Johan Hari. Yeah. Uh, Al- <laughs> Alyssa, thank you for the call. Appreciate it. You're going to be. You're still in that age group where your brain is prone to these things, and I guarantee you will get better with time. But I also will guarantee you the treatment works if it's properly done. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you All so right. much. I appreciate it. All right, you got it. Take care. Bye bye. So yeah, I, I had the I had panic and anxiety. You know, to me, I was actually depressed when I was having all that panic attack, and, mm. and the anxiety was more of a manifestation of the depression, mm-hmm. and then the panic was on top of everything else. Ooh. And and I wondered that was back when I never have liked cannabis, but I smoked it a bit in college. I lived on a floor with a bunch of stoners, <laughs> and they were convinced I just wasn't doing it properly. Because how could I not love it? because I didn't and, and so they insisted that I do a little more with them and I, panic was not far after that and I have since then clinically seen people with really terrible panic attacks mm-hmm. as though there's something for some people about the cannabis where it opens up a circuit where you can be more prone to panic oh hugely that's yeah. like 100% a thing I have so many friends that I say don't ever smoke pot like you'll yeah. be an absolute basket case like it's definitely I'm still intrigued yeah. I'm still tempted to because everyone everyone oh it's so different today oh I know, highly but, recommend it so, yeah <laughs> but so it's legalized here in California yes. do, you, do you agree with the way we've done it here um I know I'm I'm very integrated into that community and I'm not a huge fan of it, but I think the way it's been done, yeah, generally speaking, if we we're going to legalize it the way we we're going to legalize it, yeah, like absolutely. You're this fine is with great. It. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't like the way that the businesses, like the private corporations have gone about it. Like, it's going to be t- it's some... gonna be the next big tobacco. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I, it would I, actually I... probably be better if big tobacco got involved. Not that they, I'm a they proponent. Are. They of are that. quietly behind the scenes getting involved. And, yeah. uh, I just I keep reading stuff that Benjamin who Benjamin Rush is Benjamin oh, Rush was one of the signers of the Neck Declaration of Independence and mm-hmm. he was he was George Washington's doctor mm-hmm. ended up killing George Washington kind of, <laughs> but but like like always the medical system will do you harm if you spend yeah. too much time with him mm-hmm. but uh, he just kept writing and writing and writing about this tobacco thing I don't think it's going to go well I think businesses are getting he just kept predicting what took another two hundred years to really develop that's crazy yeah and I and I feel. I'm sort of feeling the same way about cannabis. Like, I don't, I don't think this is going to go well. I'm worried about it. I don't think anything yeah. in society is going to go well, but we talk about this. I have a <laughs> lot of hope. Said, we're off. I have we're a done, lot everybody. of hope. And for that, good night, good night. <laughs> Nothing's going to go well. K of smoking. That's yeah, it. We're let's done. Let's just all go back to the cave. No. So, uh, <laughs> hey, I have, I have some really, really good calls coming here. So let's try to get some Perfect. of these. This is uh, Chris. Go ahead there, Chris. Hi, Dr. Drew. Hey, buddy. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Uh my father was a professor of medicine at UCLA for 35 years, and 
the founding medical director of the Pritikin Longevity Center. Wow, crazy. Yeah, and so 40 years ago, he showed that with healthy living, we could reduce our blood pressure and get off drugs. But that information hasn't really filtered into the full medical system. Well, I, I would argue that compared to, I remember the Pritikin Center, and I remember when I was in medical school, it coming up sort of in the background quite a bit. And I would argue that pretty much most of what he was advocating has sort of become axiomatic in the sense that it, it's sort of accepted as true and, and good thinking. Just we can't get anybody to do it. <laughs> That's, I think, the sort of zone we're in now. Do you disagree? Well, I've been working with him for 20 years, and so I figured out that, well, Hans Selye said symptoms of stress are fatigue, and so people who are tired don't want to exercise, and bad news stress turns off happy chemicals in our brains, and then we don't enjoy exercise, and we turn to junk food, nicotine, alcohol, and illegal drugs to turn I, I, happy I, chemicals back I on. I like the construct. I would argue it's even more complicated. And and you, your question here, I think, dovetails into what I'm thinking a little bit, which is that our our childhood experiences are coming to bear on our psycho, biological, emotional condition in the present. Definitely. Yeah. Well. Um, you explored the same thing in your awesome book, Cracked, mm -hmm. about traumatic experiences yep. and addiction. Yep. And But my more important question was, the new California Surgeon General, Nadine Burke-Harris, is on a mission to make healthcare trauma-informed. And All for it. So I feel like that's All relevant. I got you. The, the, that's great. Yeah, everything. Everything. I, uh, criminal justice, everything. Uh, psychiatric here, here's, there's, it's, oh, I have a flood of feelings about it for sure. It's the right thing to do. I am delighted that finally, you got to know Chris, that in the nineties people would, I was absorbing tons of criticism. There was even, believe it or not, uh, a whole school of thought that said that adverse childhood experiences are overstated and really don't do anything to people in their adult life. So at least we've woken up from that sl that slumber, right? Not only have we, we, we woken from that slumber, but now we're starting to talk about what to do about people that are traumatized. The idea of trauma-informed therapy or trauma-informed approach to everything, I totally agree with, but it's way more complicated than most of my peers understand. And to do it well takes a lot of experience and a lot of training, and we're just not doing that right now. So that's my that's my discomfort with this orientation. We if, if we're going to accept that it's true, which it is, we must arm ourselves accordingly, which we are not. Does that make sense? Well, that's where I'm. I'm working with my father's now 85, and he's got severe dementia, oh. and he's gone to. It's easy for me because I know his life history to connect it to his traumatic experiences. The dementia but over the last uh, ten be years. Be careful! <laughs> be careful! That's that's a that's a jump. That's a jump. I by the way, I was um, uh, I used to work in a dementia hospital, and the first thing I noticed when I went in there was particularly the men. All the men had pictures of themselves by the bedside, and they were like admirals in the navy and captains of industry and just crazy stuff they've been doing and i started wondering i thought like you i thought oh my gosh stress has got to be the thing it's got to be stress inducing and dementia in these men so i started interviewing their families and to a person they all said that this man had no stress he loved his job which confused me but i found a common link amongst all of them none of them slept they all restricted their sleep so I'm of the opinion that that may be a bigger issue than the stress itself. Did your dad uh, work excessively and not sleep? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's a definitely a factor. So, uh, you know, when you're locked down, the brain gets a lot more blood. Yep. Yep. Um, but uh, Nadine Burke Harris, the new California Surgeon General, has repeatedly pointed out that a high ACEs score adverse childhood experiences yep. 
is a factor in dementia. Uh, that makes sense to me, that, that, but that doesn't mean it's causational, right? It may be that there are substance uses involved in that. It may be people aren't sleeping normally because of the ACE, which we know they don't. It may be other psychiatric conditions that are also associated with dementia. So again, don't be careful. This research needs to be parsed out very, very carefully. I appreciate your call, Matt. I got to keep moving on. Uh, I have no idea what you're pointing at, Miss Producer. Oh, she wants me to look at my text that she's sending me. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> let's see. Oh, I've yeah. got Travis on the line. Oh. Let's get Travis in here. Why don't we? Uh, uh, how do I get him on my thing here? Okay, hold on. This is going to take a little doing because there's about 40 things on my screen. Hold on. He's already in? Travis, are you there? Travis? I'm here, Dr. Drew. Can you hear me? I got you, man. How are you? Oh, doing well. How are you doing? We are good. We're here this with... Way? Okay, get, 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 yeah, yes. Don't so, no, let Travis block take your face. Take the spotlight again. Uh, do you guys know each other? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I like Travis. I think he's brilliant mind. Travis, you are part of the Venice oh, Neighborhood yeah. Council. Uh, you had a recent poll on the uh, mayor's leadership. Tell us no, about I'm that. The no? I'm actually not on the neighborhood council. I'm, I'm one of uh, Venice residents that are in a group called Venice United. Um, and but that's right though. The the VNC did a poll and and basically what came of it was that I think it was like uh, the vast majority of people, like 85 percent or 90 percent, were either dissatisfied with Bonin, Mike Bonin, and Mayor Garcetti, or extremely dissatisfied with Mike Bonin. From Eric Garcetti. And was the primary reason the homeless and, crisis? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the primary reason is, is the crime and, and the uh, the transients and vagrants here that are kind of under the guise of homelessness that are living in encampments and breaking into people's homes and assaulting people and doing drugs out in the open. Mm-hmm. 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 Do you live in Venice? I, I had Venice. to move from Venice because it had become such a crisis. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to pay like $2,000 for a glorified room when I can't walk right. to the shop in the middle of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but I'm hearing the frustration in Travis's mm -hmm. and, the, and the characterization of his, what the, what the other side calls his un unhoused neighbors. I, I just call the sick people on the streets that are yeah. dying. Yeah. Is that eventually you're going to see horrible behaviors. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of these conditions. Yeah. And now, and then eventually, and if we don't be careful, uh, if let's say horrible infectious disease break out, which is mm -hmm. inevitable, also yeah. you're going to start to see. My fear is sort of vigilanteism. I mean, I, I hear Travis is on his last thread here. What what is the community doing? Well, you want to answer? Well, okay. we see it all the time. Like if you go on the kind of localized next door um, app, people will post. What are we going to personally do to deal with this issue? Trying to the, instigate well, the police this can't do anything. It's did I say badge? I meant vig vigilante. <laughs> vigilanteism. <laughs> She's from Wales, everybody. I mean, that, I mean, if it was a group of women, I think that's what I'm going to call my group now. Well, if, if, Why it, not? if it ever it's comes part of the to fourth that, fourth wave feminist movement. <laughs> but what Maybe Travis? It's fifth wave. Yeah. <laughs> God. What Travis really touches on, though, is the lack of common sense that went into the decision making behind these policies that perpetuate these issues. Yeah. Let's decriminalize drugs because it's going to be better for a handful of demographics throughout California. Well, but to be fair, but let me defend not... that decision. Mm -hmm. the, they also, at this stage, they're going to end up in prison. Yeah. But just because they're drug addicts, they don't belong in prison. No, they don't. Right. So we agree on that. Yeah, no, so absolutely. So take, taking them out of prison is a good thing. Not under the streets. Yeah. Not under the streets. It's it's like taking, um, have you ever heard like the man falls down a hole analogy? No. It was, okay, so man falls down a hole. This sounds like a sociologist thing. It's, I honestly, I think it was from the West Wing, which I can't believe, like I hate mm, that because I, I do feel like the West Wing kind of like ruined politics, mm. even though I do like that show. Um, but okay, so man falls down a hole. And uh, priest comes along. He's like, Father, Father, please help me. I've fallen down this hole. I can't get out. The priest writes uh, prayer, throws it down, or a couple of Hail Marys or whatever, throws it down, carries on. Short while later, a doctor comes along. And the guy's like, Doctor, Doctor, help me out of here. I've like fallen down. I can't get out. Help me. Doctor writes a prescription, throws it down the hole, moves along. A little while later, a friend comes along. Guy's like, oh my God, Joe, thank God you're here. I've been stuck down this hole for ages. Please help me out. The friend jumps down the hole and the guy's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? He's like, 
don't worry about it. I've been down here before and I know my way out. So that's how these laws need to be practiced. They need to be built around understanding the human behavior right. that comes right. with addiction. And, and so you would think in organizing policies, you would talk to mental health professionals or people exactly. who work in this field. Well, yes. That's shocking. What a shocking idea. Well, what the leadership of California has done is just thrown like a bunch of dirty needles down the hall and just said, like, deal with it. Travis, what are your, what's your opinion on all this? Well, you know, I actually am someone who voted for, uh, for Prop 47. And, and in my opinion, it was a mistake because I think that uh, I think we need mandatory rehab. And I think what's happening is by making these drugs basically legal and making them from a felony to a misdemeanor, I think we've got a lot more people doing drugs. Sure. And I get a lot of my well, information from well, homeless people, ex-homeless people, as course. well as the LAPD. Of course. And of course. i got to yeah. tell you what I've heard. I'm sorry, go ahead. I would say, if you, if you yeah. legalize, legalize drugs and trafficking and stealing to support your habit, my patients are coming. They're going to show up, and they're going to show up from all over the, all far and wide, from every land. They're going to show up, no, no, no. and that's what's happening. I'm saying, what I'm saying is, I voted for Prop 47, but it was a mistake. I don't think we should make these drugs legalized. I think that these drugs, meth and uh, heroin, should still be illegal because one, we need a deterrent. Two, these drugs are going to kill you eventually, and if you overdose, they could kill you immediately. And three, what's happening is when you start doing these drugs, you don't really care too much about paying rent or mortgage. You right. really will just camp out in a tent yeah. outside of your home. And right. anybody who lives here, they think will tell you the same thing. So I'm not saying throw them in jail with killers or hardened criminals, but I am saying that we need like a mandatory rehab. And so yeah. I think Prop 47 was a huge mistake. And I think we need to make these drugs illegal again. Sure. I mean, yeah, again, I'm never going to say we should... Uh make drugs illegal because let, I'm, let me ask you this yeah. if we're not willing to set up the social network to deal with this yeah oh yeah no if that doesn't exist absolutely it's yeah. the next like most common sense policy right. but it's kind of like and, the and same it's, and with, it's also ends the genocide it does end the genocide but it does it just move the genocide into a prison like does that not then perpetuate the concentration camp just within the prison walls I don't Case know. can be made. That's yeah. Case so can be made. I mean, what we need to do is figure out how to monetize the mandatory rehabs, but do it in such a way that it doesn't turn into another complex. Yes. Yeah. Which it will. Which it will, because that's the nature of human behavior. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, incredibly sad. So, other than modifying forty-seven, <laughs> Travis, any other plans? Well, I think the um, you know the answer, and I've been saying this to you know, a number of people, and we've got you know to me it looks like about ninety percent of California has not been developed yet. So if you just go, we have plenty of land. If you just go seventy five hundred miles east of Los Angeles, you, you could uh, you could immediately provide uh, beds, toilets, showers, rehab, Wi Fi, and it's not going to cost seven hundred thousand dollars per unit, right? You can do this immediately and immediately get people off of the sidewalks and start improving their lives and the conditions they're living in. And I think what's happening right now is like the two of you were stating is we've got this homeless industrial complex mm -hmm. that started with good intentions, of people, but now it's turned into essentially uh, profiting. And so you've got a lot of people that are just get basically coming to Los Angeles for not just legalized drugs, but for the, the prospect of free housing and free food. And the problem you know, is just getting worse. And if you talk to, you know, you look at what, the mayor and Bonin are saying, and you know, the, the party line is that every day 150 people fall into homelessness. Well, I think at least in Venice, you got 150, or it looks to me like you have more transients coming to Los Angeles. And so, those lawmakers, there's a reason it's not allowed. There's a lot of reasons it's not allowed. You're not allowed to sleep on the sidewalks, you know. Um, for one thing, you, it's just unsanitary conditions, but another thing is you just we're basically collecting, you know masses of people coming to Los Angeles for free sidewalk camping, free services, the promise of housing, and essentially lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, I mean, this is happening from across the country. People are seeing Los Angeles, they're seeing San Francisco, Seattle as these, again, like just free Word. living. People will Word come here. Yeah. yeah, you can do drugs. Yeah, to you come and hang out. Live yeah. at the beach, yeah. free. It's, uh, they're just yeah. moving their lifestyles from other no, states. It, when you yeah. eliminate property laws and mm -hmm. you eliminate drug laws and you uh, let anything go my, my patients come my patients are going to show up and they'll do that until they die oh, and so you're uh, literally fueling their death so mm -hmm. congratulations los mm -hmm. angeles Good, great job
Well, Travis, uh, anything else you want people to know about before we let you go? Well, what I'd like to see happening is our leadership actually start doing things that are helping the truly homeless. So it's, it's, it gets impossible to help the truly homeless person when you've got essentially a lot of people coming here for, you know, legalized drugs. Right. So I get it. Oh, Boise ruling said that you can't criminalize homelessness, but it didn't just say that people can sleep wherever they want. I think that, you know, the councilmen and the, the mayor need to start um, setting up some laws that right. restrict where people can sleep. No, no, you, but you, setting but up we need, some areas. Here's what we need. Laws that can that allow us, this is the thing you were talking about in Europe where they help mm-hmm. sick people. Mm-hmm. We don't help sick people in this country because it's against the law. Yeah. So we need to modify the Lantern and Petra Short Act. We need to expand conservatorships. We need to change 47, as he's saying. Mm-hmm. And then we can actually go help these people. Because now, not only can we not get near them or touch them, we can't even get near or touch their belongings. So your idea about putting them out onto land elsewhere where they can thrive and do as they please, you can't do that now. You're not allowed even to discuss that with them. You can, when they're so sick that they're a harm to self or other, you can put them in a hospital for a few minutes Mm -hmm. until they say, I don't want to kill myself anymore and I know where McDonald's is. That's all they have to say to get out. That's it. And that, you don't know that? I didn't know that. Oh, no. that's our oh laws. That's why, that, it's called the Landrum and Petra Short Act. We went overnight in 1972 from the criteria that every other country in the world mm-hmm. uses for the most part, which mm-hmm. is need for care, mm-hmm. right? Needs care. Sick, needs care. Yeah. We went from that to harm to self or other. And harm to self or other became more and more and more narrowly mm-hmm. examined. There's also a vague term called gravely disabled that you can't get to stick to anybody. All Again, all they have to say is, I have a tent and I know where McDonald's is. Then you, then you, And I have a plan. And I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to kill somebody else. That's it. They're out the moment they say that. That's literally a get out of jail free card. It's it's. They could be saying, I am I am Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing voices. Mm-hmm. But I know where McDonald's is. I have a tent. And yeah. And and I don't want to take my medication. Who are you to say? Who are you to say, Kay? How dare you? I am so glad that my copy of American Psychosis hasn't shown up yet because I would be apoplectic on this show. I, I may give I may it. give you my copy and then you can send it back to me. Oh, because that's what this that I recommend that book to everybody called American Psychosis that's very much about how we got here, which is mm-hmm. a whole other story. Travis, thank you. Good luck with everything. And, uh, you know, let us know how we can help, okay? Thank you. Appreciate right, having right. me on. Thanks for calling Thanks. in. Bye, Trav. You got it. How do you know Travis? Because from the Venice community? Everyone on the West Side Everyone knows, knows everyone. Travis. Yeah, I, it's just one of those things. And I mean, like, you know, it's Travis. He's just, how can you not? <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, here's an interesting call. And I, I like Irene's uh, perspective on this. And I think she is absolutely correct. Uh, Irene, how are you? Hello, Dr. Drew. Hi, Irene. What's going on? Um, you know, um, I, I wanted to talk to you about um, your thoughts on um, addressing the lack of continuity of care mm-hmm. uh, between inpatient and outpatient. And I was just listening to you right now, and it just, like, hit the spot about you talking about the fact that if you say you're okay, and you mm-hmm. know what I mean, and then yes. you're just out, and yes. then you're left yes. to kind of for yourself for outpatient services yeah yeah and and sorry i'm, I'm getting emotional <laughs> is this is this you it's or somebody that, like, you, you or somebody you love was left out somebody i love and yeah. it's just it's frustrating that you know it's because i can do that and i can provide the support but there's so many people out there that don't have that and I know. I know. it's just frustrating to see how that system is like that it's just yeah. What do you, what do you, would you like to see? What would help you help your loved one? Because I think I know what the fix is, but what would what do you think? Uh, you know, I, I, mentally, like I see how, like if, like I had physical, right, like a surgery or whatever, and I see the support from home to from the doctors to home, but yet when it's a mental illness, like. You don't see that. You don't see that. You don't, you see, don't that see it be, because Irene. Because oh, it's there, but we have privileged psychiatric symptoms in the law. We've said if you say, "I don't really have a problem," I don't want that ongoing care. It's okay. While if you had a knee replacement 
and it was time to go home, and you said, I don't really want that care, we would not allow that. We would get you the care. We would get you the care to yeah. help with this. And because we've privileged psychiatric symptoms based on 50-year-old laws mm -hmm. and 50-year-old movies, like One yeah. Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that we can't help the people who have something called anosognosia. Anosognosia is a condition that stroke patients get, schizophrenics get, drug addicts get, bipolar patients get, which is a parietal region of the brain that is, gives us the insight into what's happening to us. When that system in our brain doesn't operate, we lose insight. We start mm -hmm. thinking we don't have a problem. We don't see what's happening as a result. It's a part of the condition, and we have privileged that. If it happens not from dementia, not from a stroke, because if it happens from dementia or a stroke, we jump right in. But if it happens from psychiatric illness, well, that's that's he's at his liberty now. He or she's at their liberty to do as they please. Isn't that insane? I mean, no other country does that. Yeah. No other country does that. So that's really the problem, Irene. <laughs> If we dealt more realistically with that it's issue, hard. I know it's hard, and gave you, say, some temporary conservatorship or something until those symptoms settle down, something. There are many, many different ways to do this. Uh, thank you for your call, Irene. I've got to go to another caller here. Uh, this is Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Dr. Drew. Hi, Kay. Carol. Hello. Carol's Twitter account is at, at LA Vagrants dedicating I, we've seen all your images there on twitter i follow you uh so uh where do you come in on all this and what do we do about it <laughs> well your your words when, when you just said la is fueling death really really struck me and you know i know we we're talking more so about those sick on the street but you know also the victims and just over the last couple of weeks i mean hearing some of the stories we heard about, you know, the taxi, elderly taxi cab driver who was stabbed to death by a vagrant for no reason. Um, you know, the ruling on the West Hollywood. I mean, some guy saw a vagrant stealing stuff from a 7-Eleven. He offered to buy him the stuff, which was so kind. And the vagrant somehow got angry, waited outside for him and tried to ax him to death. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm at a point where I don't mean to be the Debbie Downer of today, but LA is fueling death on both ends, and it's a humanitarian crisis. It's two pronged. It is the 59,000 people dying on the streets in LA County, and it's also us citizens who, you know, Kay was a victim, I was a victim. I mean, it, quite frankly, you talk to your friends, everyone has a story. Some are very worse than others. Not but, only, Carol, does everyone point, have a story? We all you know what's pretty interesting? Much have a story. What, not only do you have a story, we hear these rhetoric about the crime stats being down. Everybody I know has a crime story too, yeah. where, where they didn't call police mm -hmm. because why bother? Yeah, uh, everybody I know that. So the crime right. stats are completely distorted by that fact. Well, it's like this macro propaganda. Like right. I, I, I really didn't realize the magnitude of the issue until people like Harold started posting about this on Twitter. I mean, you talk about vigilantes. Like this is media vigilantism actually getting this information out there. Like calling it a humanitarian crisis. Yeah public safety crisis, yeah. reshaping public understanding of this issue. Yeah, is rather than saying it's in income disparity in housing, yeah. oh which has nothing God, to do with this. Don't even get me started. Yeah, it has nothing to do with <laughs> that. I'm not saying those things don't exist. They do exist. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with this problem. Yeah, it, it is not the origin of this crisis. And yeah, talking about it from a real-life perspective of what goes on day-to-day -day on our streets is the only way that this issue is going to Which shift. is Carol's thing, right, Carol? Yeah. God, I'm For shop. sure. And, you know, it's amazing how I have so many people come to me because, you know, the at LA Vagrant Twitter thread, it's all like minded people. They're concerned, they're victims. I even have former meth heads, you know, who <laughs> send advice and, and they've, they've gotten out of that right. and they're back living healthy lives. Right. And, you know, it, I have um, one follower who I've befriended who she's wonderful and, and her brother's living in a tent, you know, right. on, under a freeway in LA and she's just crestfallen. So it's brought together this really um, interesting group of LA County citizens who, who are all fed up. And, and I have to say, I, I have a new motto and perhaps it's coming from the fact that I'm a victim myself, but my, my new motto, because I'm seeing this progressively get worse. And Dr. Drew, the last time I spoke to you and Leanne was in July, it, it's gotten so much worse, especially yeah. down here in the South Bay. And my new motto is every walk by a vagrant is a chance. It is. 
it's a 50% chance that person is kind and they're keeping to themselves and just doing their thing, whatever that is. There's a 50% chance they will be aggressive. They'll threaten you, you know, either verbally hurt you or as we've seen, you know, the last couple of months, kill you. They mm-hmm. will kill you or they will throw a bucket of their hot diarrhea over your head like happened to the Did woman in Hollywood. And I just, yeah, I, I just keep, you know, I walk by these folks and I just say, God, keep me safe. Keep me and my child safe right now. And I, I'm, I've gotten to a point where how do I live here? I mean, how do I be a responsible parent and actually say that's okay? That's an okay lifestyle. That every day we're going to walk by and have to say, please keep us safe as we right. just it's walk impossible. down. It's impossible. You know, it's impossible. To, Alyssa, sidewalk. how do you think I feel as a clinician? Because I know how to treat this and it's not complicated. So every time they say it's a complicated problem, I want them to shut the fuck up <laughs> because it's not complicated right. if we had the right. proper right. laws to deal with it. Yes. Yeah. It's a common sense issue. Right. And And, you know, for sure. And Dr. Drew, you brought up something before. I, it was like two phone calls ago about, um, you know, it was, it was about Prop 47 and what someone has to do to get arrested nowadays. And we had that issue in Hermosa Beach just this week of, you know, a vagrant set up an encampment along our green belt, which is a walkway. It's kind of a city park and it spans Manhattan Beach, Hermosa and Redondo. And um, the kids all walk the, this green belt pathway to get to school. And I'm talking elementary school children, eight and 10 year olds with their backpacks. So this guy set up outside and Hermosa Beach PD was flooded with calls. And they said, listen, there's nothing we can do. He's allowed to live there. Um, his garbage is all over. He's smoking cigarettes, which, by the way, is that alone is against the law in um, Hermosa to do that for publicly. Ta- He's Carol, throwing Carol, cigarettes Carol, into the dry slow down. brush. For, for, ta- <laughs> for taxpayers. It's for taxpayers. It's illegal. Yeah. Relax. Relax. Yes. Not your own house. <laughs> exactly. Tax for tax taxpayers. So, well, 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 so bottom line, um, it dawned on me that, you know, the, the whole town was a flutter about this. And we know, because we're such a small town, that the kids get out of school around 2.30 and I said, you know, I, I have some time. I'm going to go and sit there and in my car and just make sure these kids are safe. And I did that. And as I'm sitting there, I see him start swinging a cane into the air. Mm-hmm. Then I see the girls' high school track team start running right by him Uh-oh. while he's acting erratic and agitated. Um, so I called the Hermosa police. He also pulled down his pants at one point. He didn't do anything crazy, uh, but he did pull them down. Of course. And so I called the Hermosa police. I said, enough is enough. I said, the children are getting out of school. They are walking by him. Why am I the only one sitting here making sure they're safe? And they said, we don't have the resources and we can't do anything. Right. And I said, they can't, well, that, that, a police they officer can't, should at least be here. But, they, but if they were there, they would just be standing. They wouldn't be able to do anything. They they are no, prevented I from doing. I know, but their I know, job. but just, just well, well, it gets better. Don't worry. But for the hour, for the hour that those kids are getting out of school, mm-hmm. there should have been someone there. I I don't I, know. I don't was, okay, Maybe it was no, be an official from much. the school. Yeah, the fact that I I don't even have a kid in school, and I'm sitting there making sure other people's kids are safe. So as I'm sitting there. You know, so I called the Hermosa police. I kind of lost my mind. So when I saw him pull down his pants, I got really upset as the kids are walking by. And then, sure enough, one officer showed up, and a second, and a third. And it took about five minutes before he was shouting into the air that he's going to kill somebody dead. And to your point, that is when he was finally taken down and right. taken in. But, but I promise I mean, you, if you got to the hospital, if you got to the hospital, the hospital the Carol, I got to yeah. run. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us, though. I really appreciate it. We've got to appreciate the call. But I will okay. guarantee you that if he, got, if he got to the hospital and said, I was just kidding, does not put on the hold, taken off the hold immediately. This well, is the deal. What is the, the thinking behind this? Is it supposed to be some kind of like, liberties. I was about to say some Civil kind of, liberties. yeah, liberty. I we, just, who are you to say? You just have, I just have 30 years of experience, and I know what can help this guy not die and yeah. get better, and even return to a productive life, potentially. Who am I? Who am I to say? Yeah, no, he knows better. Hey, special guest coming on the line, the one, the only, Jillian Barbary. Jillian? Uh-oh, oh no, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hang on, Jillian, I pushed the wrong button. This is when I was supposed there to you are, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> You're always pushing my buttons. I'm great, Dr. Drew. How are you guys? Hi, Kay. Hi. Were you on their show with Jillian and John? Not yet. I'm no. going to say yet. Well, yet, but Jillian and I are saying farewell to KBC. When's your last day? 
Thursday's mine. What about you? Monday or Tuesday. The the mass singer was maybe wanting me to do something on Tuesday, and, and uh, our program director very kindly let me do that if possible. And then and then you have the, the White House. Then I'm going to the White House. Yeah, and I'm going to call back in. I'm giving what? you a talk. At, yeah, I'm giving a talk at the White House on this issue, and it's not exactly this issue, but Homelessness. the history of this issue. And mm-hmm. here's the deal: I am one clinician. When I arrived at Las Encinas Hospital in 1985. There was a, it was like a museum of psychiatry. The, the, I, I was doing just medical services then, mm-hmm. and a lot of the patients there were left over from psychiatry for the mm-hmm. last 30 years, and it was not pretty. What psychiatrists had done, the excesses of the previous 30 years were uncanny, frankly. Then I stayed there for 30 years, and I've been out for about 10. So I had a ringside seat to the entire mess of the American mental health care right. system. Right. So I'm going to talk about that at oh, the that White House. Fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. And it goes, it, it really goes hand in hand with, um, uh, and I, I should ask you this, it's more of a question, with um, job loss and drug abuse and, um, you know, people being put out on the streets. I don't understand why we don't have here in America, when I was growing up in Canada, they had facilities, they had, um, you know, hospitals essentially <sighs> for, they would call them the, insane or people that were mentally challenged and they were housed and we don't have any anymore he destroyed that system systematically that's what my talk is going to be about how we destroyed that why we destroyed that ah. Kay's going to read about that in a book called american psychosis that's what that book is about and uh and we've been talking about it here for the last hour or so too we're getting lots of opinions about it but jillian tell me more what so you're you're going to end your show on this week and where can we find you? Thursday, what are you, yes, what yes. are you doing? Where can we find you? Okay, so I'm going to be, I'm doing a podcast, of course. And um, we are, we just shot or taped our first one. And I don't see exactly, you know, life stuff from marriage to divorce and adoption and addiction and sex and menopause and cancer. It's just going to be life stuff. And so... Um, I have a lot of, you know, just like you do, revolving guests and co-hosts, and it's just so going to be I need to be fun. a guest, I need to be a guest on your show. Yes? Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. You have Thank to you. be. Um, are you, so uh, the whole change and transition at KBC happened, essentially, you know, I know they've done a few articles, and I said, you know, this is sort of the way, and you and I have been talking behind the scenes a little bit, like, stuff happens like this all the time where they decide to syndicate. It's cheaper for them, and it is what it is, you know? It was a great run, and and I love everybody there. But, um, yeah, they've completely changed the format. They did keep my co-host, though, that John will be doing, I think, new to three now. Hey, listen, I, I, yeah, I've been through so many radio things like this i we used to be adam and i used to, yeah adam yeah. and i used to be syndicated on a very famous alternative station in washington dc called whfs and they would they would have a, a concert every year where they filled rfk stadium it was hugely popular it was one of our big affiliates and a lot of people from k rock actually went over to hfs and was doing some administrative work there and so i know exactly what happened because they told the story later which was Ratings were struggling, yeah. but it wasn't doing terribly. One day, the administration walks in, and they ha- we have a mandatory meeting at 11 o'clock, and they walked in the room at 11 and said, at 2 o'clock, we are, from then on, Ranchero music. That's it. Oh, my God. And it's, everyone here is fired, and oh we're, going, we're going with Ranchero music. And, and that's radio. That's wow. how you, f- you flip formats, you flip ideas, and... You know, yeah. that's how radio works. That's how it goes. Wow, there's some just like insane decision making that. in this country. Like I'm just sat here like, what? Why? <laughs> it's a dynamism Who? we prefer to defend, yeah. okay? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I love this country. I, I feel so honored <laughs> to live here. Like moving from, you know, somewhere with a queen on the money as well. But like, oh my goodness. It's, I've never seen it's just. It's interesting, right? Oh God. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we you know, it's. Uh, and I. I I'm from a place where we have queens on our money too, because I'm from Canada, so yeah. we're into the Commonwealth, and the queen is all over our money. Yeah, um, we had the same hospitals. It is quite too. a difference, isn't it? Oh, it's yeah. I mean, I, we speak the same language, but it, we don't speak the same language, kind of thing. And that's yeah. not to say that I think that Britain is better. It is not. Got its own Brexit problems. defines it as being a yeah. bad place now. But um, yeah, it's uh, next level. Yeah. Next level. Wow. Well, Jillian, I thank you for saying hi, next and thank level. you for. Uh, it's been great working with you over there all this time. Oh yeah. 
Next time. Uh, Love you so much, Dr. Drew. And we, I'll do your show, and we'll see each other, no doubt, soon. Call Susan. We'll get set up. Okay? Absolutely. We definitely we need, need a dinner. I love you dearly. Yes, and uh, you and your 50,000 shows that you've got going on, <laughs> you have to call me in between. We'll have dinner. All right. We'll it's do. so true. It's crazy, but it's <laughs> fabulous. Know why. All right, Dr. Drew, thanks. Great All talking right. to you, Kay. Bye, Joe. Bye, Bye nice guys. to meet you. All right, we're going to take another little break. Uh, of course, I've got Kay Smythe here. Uh, the call-in number uh, is, put it up there, uh, 984-237-3739. One day I'll learn it <laughs> by heart. Uh, 942 Dr. Drew, of course, also. So I got lots of great calls lining up here. I'm going to try to get to some of them. Maybe some more general sort of love line-esque type calls I will try to answer now as well. Uh, we will talk to you after the break. The CBD industry is still pretty much the Wild West. When it comes to claims and criticisms, the science is catching up with the industry. We will have clinical science soon enough, and there seems to be an overwhelmingly positive response these days to CBD's efficacy. We've all heard the reports, and luckily, our good friends at Social CBD are raising the industry testing standards. They like to say they are test-obsessed. Social CBD works closely with their suppliers and multiple third-party labs to ensure you are getting exactly the package that they say you are getting. High-quality CBD with 0.0 THC. And Social CBD wants you to be skeptical. That's why they put a QR and batch code on every package. This allows you to check all the test results for your product, not general testing, the product, the one, the specific batch you bought. And while Social CBD broad spectrum products are available in a range of formulations, each of which is clearly described so you can make an informed decision without all that hype and promises that sound too good to be true. To learn more, go to drdrew.com slash social CBD. That is my website, drdrew.com slash S-O-C-I-A-L CBD. For a limited time, you can save 20% at checkout with the code Dr. Drew. Now let's get back to the show. Needles have increasingly become a part of everyday life. Proper disposal is both difficult and expensive. We have the solution. Simpler, safer, affordable, and fulfills the obligation to protect our environment. A single stick with something like this means tracking down the user. It means blood tests for the person's stock. It means possibly medication for an extended period of time. Needle sticks are devastating. No more. Incinerate the needle. Needle goes in this port. It's over. Done. Needle gone. We all have loved ones who use needles. Keep their home safe. Medical offices are loaded with sharps. We are using ancient technology to protect our patients, our staff, ourselves. You know what needle sticks do. You know the cost and the devastation psychologically and physically potentially from a needle stick. Eliminate that completely. Stop using ancient technology. Sand MIDI. It will solve your problems. Find out more at NeedleDestructionDevice.com. The strangest call you've ever received on your show uh, from a caller. I'm not sure you want me to really get into this, but a guy that called and said, you guys are willing to listen to everything, and I want to know why people freak out when they hear about my monogamous, loving relationship. Turns out it was his dog, Brutus, in a Killy Collie mix. And um, he was having relations with it. Yeah, let's talk about something else. I think so. So, welcome back, everybody. Great Tom Green is going to be on Dr. Drew After Dark coming up. Uh, they'd be a few weeks down the road. I think I'm talking to him tomorrow. And uh, we are taking your calls, as I said. Uh, we've got a few more visitors from the old KBC show that is going to end this week. And just people to, you know, people that have been part of that show since the beginning. Let's get some calls here. This is uh, Dale. Hey, Dale. Hi, Dr. Drew. No. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I wanted to, uh, I used to live. Uh oh, you broke. You... The love line when I, when I first got clean and I wanted to, thank you for saying something that was really a piece of my puzzle. Can you hear me okay? I hear you now. Mm -hmm. hear a piece <laughs> of your puzzle, which was what? Uh, good. <laughs> okay. You said. I've heard a lot of people say, I'm really glad I didn't use last night. But you've never heard anyone say, I'm glad I did use last. So it was, uh, it resonated with me that night and it resonates with me to this moment. And thank you, buddy. You, my you privilege. made a difference. In to my me, I, I love stories like that because it's, uh, thank you, Dale. I love stories like that because it is, 
so indicative of the magic of recovery. Mm-hmm. Re- recovery is really from addiction happens because of other human beings. Yeah. I mean, people talk about spiritual moments coming in, but I really believe that it's all initiated interpersonally. And we all carry different pieces, as he says, of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Our personality connects with them in certain ways. It's why we build teams when we treat addiction, because you never know who's going to be the one that gives them that little piece that they need to find the motivation and sow the spiritual material can get in. Well, this is why it's so great that you're doing millions of different shows. So, so there are millions of different <laughs> millions ways. Of opportunities. To, well, just like to perpetuate this work. I mean, you've been doing this for so long now. And that, I mean, does that happen on a regular basis? People contact you yes. to say thank you. Oh, yes, that's, but, but I, I that's look marvelous. at it as, that is marvelous. But I, I look at it as n- not me, it's them. I'm just sort of available. Although I must say that in recent, probably years, but maybe certainly months, I'm realizing that, that there's not a lot of physicians with the kind of experience I've had in medicine and psychiatry. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wanting to just give it out a lot. That's why I'm doing more speaking and being willing to go to the White House or wherever people listen to me because I, I have a perspective that I don't think my younger peers are kind of getting. I've just noticed that. They, they kind of have it. Like yeah. we talked earlier about mm-hmm. the California Attorney General that wants to talk about uh, trauma-informed care. Mm-hmm. She's right. It's absolutely true. But the whole story is a bit more complicated. If you really had the really had the experience, you'd have to plan a little more than just that one little aphorism, yeah. like trauma-informed Surgeon care. General. Surgeon General, what did I say? Attorney. Oh, Attorney General. <laughs> Surgeon General was saying that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, do you think that particularly for my generation, this kind of emerging generation now of mm-hmm. doctors, of psychiatrists, mm-hmm. psychologists, how does that kind of woke... Ness. lifestyle-ness, yes. whatever it is, inform practice. Because <sighs> all I see it as being like this absolute shitstorm caused by like this. It is a shitstorm. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I agree with the principle of wokeness. I think that, you know, making oneself aware of uh, social issues is like the first step in solving yes. them. Yes. But the way that we've been educated in this country and in Europe and in most developed countries under this kind of like constructivist idea that we are self like we self teach that uh it's funny you call it constructivist we call it post-structuralist post-modernist yeah it's kind of like it's I, I guess it's like all stemmed from what constructivism learning theory this kind of idea that we uh we decide what's factual to us based on our experience yes that's a mistake even though that's what defines a freaking opinion right so, so that's yeah. of grave concern to me. Okay. Uh, of con- and that's sort of why I want to give. But there's always been, I, I don't want to become that guy, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Who's like, these kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's always a difference in the generational mm-hmm. experiences and training. Yeah. I, I remember when I was a young physician, the the guys, the, the mostly men that were ahead of me, you know, were very concerned about us mm-hmm. for different reasons. And, uh, well, what I, were I would, those reasons for your generation? Um, they were more paternalistic, and we were very concerned about paternalism and okay. they wanted patient participation. It wasn't a bad thing. What we mm-hmm. did was a good thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were, were interested in control and things that we were giving up readily and ended up being mostly a good thing. Not entirely. It, a lot of the stuff we're talking about today is because we went too far with all that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's always a, a pendulum swing. My concern, my biggest concern about exactly what you're raising, and I don't know if I should be concerned or not, is that the actual training is being forsaken for these priorities. You know what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. And so these priorities become the training mm-hmm. and the the depths of what need to be carried out to really create experts is sort of being op- obviated or really obfuscated a little bit by these other priorities. Yeah. Now, that may be totally unfounded. But I think I'm seeing a little bit of that. I mean, the reason that I'm an expert in this field is because I ghost wrote other people's doctoral dissertations on this subject matter. So when, you know, it's me and I don't even know how many other people are ghostwriters. I mean, it's a pretty... Uh, so you've a, seen the thinking. You've seen the, the opinions that are yeah, out there. The, well, it's more the kind... Again, it kind of goes into this practice of, you know, oh my God, these doctors who are administering this care should probably be 
knowledgeable enough to write their own dissertations. Right. So that's like the first concern. Yes. And then the second concern is obviously, you know, I, I spend all day every day looking at this data and then I have yet to see any of it in practice in five years of doing this work, which means that the stuff I was writing when I started is now technically Old. irrelevant, yeah. cannot be applied. So we're having to redo the data all over again. And yeah, I mean... You're making me more anxious than I was well, already. I was going to say, maybe uh, maybe one of the things that you sh should uh, consider is going into teaching. Start your own course in this. Well, I used to. Yeah. I taught a lot. I used to teach a lot. I, but now I'm doing speaking. That's sort of what my, my latest thing mm -hmm. is. But I, uh, I, it's so funny when you said you're writing other people's dissertations. I was thinking, is that legal? Is that okay? Oh, yeah, is it's that, legal. It's I know, legal. I know. But your point is well taken <laughs> that they should be doing the writing. Yeah. Isn't that part of the skill set well and it's just That's so much easier to avoid having the responsibility of like uh, doing the work and forming maybe you could just write everything for me too <laughs> let me bring in my friend the great Lawrence Savan my guest for a, over a year on Dr. Drew on the KBC radio program Midday Live Lawrence Savan you're in New York now Hi, no, I'm here in L.A. Okay, it says from New York on my call screener thing. I'm like, what? And once again, we're going to have to meet up. And oh, because my number, <laughs> I have a New York number. Oh, so, well, uh, so we're saying, fair we're all saying farewell to KBC. So I, we're just, everyone, Mike's calling in, Jillian called in, now we got you. And I appreciate you calling in. Yeah, I mean, I I just uh, was a year ahead of you in leaving. But, <laughs> yes, you were. But um, <laughs> the greatest part about KBC was that I got to work with you. I oh. mean, that was the treat and all of it. You know what, Lauren? Do you, do you mind if, if people don't know your relation to the whole Me Too thing? Would you mind? Do you mind? I know you have to do it all the time, but do you mind sketching it a little bit? Because to me, by the way, I felt like I was sitting next to the person who said Me Too. And it was a, a privilege and really interesting watching you. <laughs> well, no, no, but listen, it was it, you. I know the consequences you've had, and I know it's been a really interesting challenge dealing with all that. Do you mind sketching that a little bit? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, well, I mean, I, as you know, and um, I spoke out because I had an encounter with Harvey Weinstein like eleven years ago, and it was a completely chance encounter. I just happened to be at a at a restaurant at a dinner party that he was at and that's how we met and we chit chatted for a bit. Um, and he tried to give me a tour of this place and there was no reason to suspect there was anything untoward. He was delightful and charming and sweet. And, um, when, you know, when we got down to the kitchen, I realized that we were in an abandoned kitchen and that this was something else. Uh, and so he, you know, he tried to kiss me, and that's when I was like, oh, I'm so sorry if I gave you the wrong impression. I just thought we were having a nice conversation. Um, and and then he cornered me, and he, he basically just masturbated in front of me, which um, was horrible. But um, now that I've gotten to know so many of his victims, I really consider myself one of the lucky ones because I didn't need anything from him. I wasn't trying to get hired by him. I wasn't trying to make it in Hollywood. I wasn't an actress. It was just a really disturbing thing that happened to me on a random night out in New York City. Um, and it wasn't something, for me personally, it wasn't something that, that traumatized me. I mean, it was kind of like this story. I, every time his name came up, I'd be like, oh, I got a great Harvey Weinstein story for you. <laughs> but when, when <laughs> Braver Women and I came forward <laughs> and, and told you know, told their truth about Harvey Weinstein, like, um, you know, Rose McGowan and Ashley Judd. Um, I came forward because he, he called them liars. And he said that, you know, he never did anything wrong. And these women were just, you know, lying and upset about their careers, which I knew was a lie only because of my, you know, one hour encounter with him. So yes, I was one of the women that said me too pretty early on. After uh, after that story was published, I, I feel like you were the first, and 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 then you did the thing that that disturbs me almost more than anything else about these encounters. Not just with him, but what women do when they're the object of victimization, they blame themselves. Yeah. How how what did Always. I do? They take a big Always. old inventory about what I did to get myself in that position, and that and you did that. And I've spoken to. So many of the other victims. By the way, there's like 90 women that came forward. So there's a lot of us. Um, and and we all did the same thing. We all said, how, you know, how could I be so stupid? How did I fall into this trap? 
what kind of signs was I giving off to him that he got the wrong impression. Whereas, you know, a lot of times we do that because we don't know how many others of, of us there are. You, you know, you kind of think it's this, this solitary thing that happens to you. But had you known that, no, you were absolutely lured into the place, you know, that he wanted you. Um, I don't. I think all of us would have had a better idea and probably would have blamed ourselves a lot less. Maybe, maybe less. But women, I just think for some reason that's your that's the move. It is an inventory. Um, I, I've seen it over and over again. Well, lots you, of other. I mean, biologically, I, yeah, biologically, I think you. Th- you know, we we're kind of biologically circuited to be agreeable and to not yes. rock the boat and yes. not make people feel uncomfortable. That's exactly so true. So anytime that we, you know, we feel conflict or we feel tension, we kind of want to relieve that tension. And so if we can put it on ourselves, we do. And part of it is that. And the other part is that we're, society conditions us well, to be that way. Yes, like, well, and, what were and, you wearing when you got raped? And what did you say to him? I mean, there's a part of, of that yes, blame, too. Yes, and, and I would argue that one of my criticisms of fourth wave feminism is an unwillingness to look at some of these tendencies that may be whatever they're just tendencies like you're describing the the agreeableness and then saying oh that exists yeah. let's help women fight against that yeah let's move them away from that agreeableness in particular situations where they need to come to their own aid and not fall into this oh what did i do because what did i do it, to, when women do that it just it really i find it emotionally i, I it hurt, it like hurts me it's like it's sad to see women do that it's unnecessary trust me well it hurts women too because they carry that around um, as guilt mm-hmm. and they carry it around as like, I, I got myself into that situation. That was somehow my fault. I brought it on myself. And so I want to keep it a secret because there's a component of shame that accompanies that as well. Oh, very much. So I um, hope, I'm hope I'm talking to people that are over that. You're not doing that? Oh, uh, no. I mean, like, well, I just want to say firstly, like, I'm so sorry that you went through all of this, Lauren. And also I don't think, women will ever be able to thank you enough for standing up and talking about it because again that's the first step in kind of breaking these perpetuated habits we're talking about it now yeah Yeah. and i mean i i mean me personally like i've dealt with the same thing um i like got into a very dark depression as a result of issues to do with this and uh and i still feel like one of the lucky ones because it's it never went so far as to yeah like as it wasn't shattering as it could be. Yeah, and um, my mom raised me very much to be uh, terrified of everything and mistrust everyone and be very, very well, Lauren, that's tough. you too. Yeah. Sure. It's, so, it's, yeah. I, I met Jackie. That's exactly how she is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember even telling my mom when I was very young and then I got my first job and I was at Fox News Channel and I had a problem with my the producer that worked above me. He was really mm, just overly friendly, really really inappropriate. And I was really young. I was probably 22. Mm -hmm. And I told my mom that he said these wildly inappropriate things. And her advice was like, keep your mouth shut, Mm -hmm. you know, see if you can get moved on a different shift, but don't rock a boat. Don't Mm -hmm. be the girl that complains because it won't serve you. And, and unfortunately she was right. I mean, that was the reality. It would not serve a woman to come forward because once you came forward and reported someone, guess what? You were the problem that had to be dealt with. I, not I them. hope we're changing. I hope uh, that's changing. And I, I hope, I pray that things have changed now. Yeah. Yeah. You're downtown right now working with the homeless? Yes. Yes. We, we've been handing out um, like survival kits to the homeless today. These big duffel bags full of plenty of toiletries, some clothes, some food, some first aid equipment, you know, things that you just, that you need if you're living on the street and you don't have anywhere to go. But the reason I love the group that I was working with, which is, they're called the Giving Spirit, is because the biggest gift that we're giving them is something you and I talked about for a year, which is the the warm handoff. So when we hand out these things, it's kind of just an excuse to really start a conversation Right. with the people on the street and figure out how long they've been there, why they're there, what can we do to help you, what services can we contact you, you know, get you in contact with. Um, but it's a great way to, to actually approach these people because they're giving them something that they appreciate. It's great. Because, you know, a lot of times they are willing to talk to you. And, and a lot of times, honestly, they just want to talk. They mm-hmm. just want to mm-hmm. have some kind of human interaction and feel human. Yeah, I've started in in New York, particularly where there's a lot more sort of intimate contact, like on the trains and stuff. I've started just talking, talking, to yeah, them and you know, like and trying to motivate them in a 
better direction because most of them will cop to what's going on and uh somebody going hey you're better than that you can do better than that here's what what about this service that service here's a phone number and they they kind of respond so many things right now in this world have interpersonal solutions oh yeah and and i think we in particular this country don't don't do not emphasize that so but lauren it was a privilege to work with you and uh, i'll miss you on the air it was a privilege to work with you too and well, I know that you're going to be on air everywhere. I mean, that was just one of your myriad of jobs. This has become a, become a I know theme that I can find today. you if I need to hear <laughs> You can doctor. find me if you need me. And, uh, yeah, next <laughs> next year in Jerusalem. All right. <laughs> next year in Jerusalem. And Kate, let me meet you too. Thank you so much. You too. All Thank Lauren, you. Talk soon. The great, talk soon. Kate. The, the great Lawrence Savon. Uh, okay, we're going to get to some of our callers now. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got a little bit of time left. I've yeah. got lots of great calls lined up. Uh, anything that, that I've left off of your plate through all this? We've meandered through a lot of different interesting stuff oh, today. Oh, I mean, we could talk for the next, like, six hours, to be honest with you. Like, this is great. Okay, yeah, good. this is all fantastic. Right. If you have anything else on your mind, uh, bring it up. Okay, this is an interesting call that Tracy's mm-hmm. got here for us. Tracy, what do you got? Hi. Hi, Tracy. Oh, Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm a dog groomer, and I work in a salon with a girl who is homeless or basically living in her truck. Um, I think she, I know she's mentally ill. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she may be an addict, but I'm not sure 100%. Mm-hmm. The boss lady hired her to kind of help her get on her feet, you know, and maybe help her get off the street. But she gets aggressive around payday and, you know, and will come in on her days off and beg for money. And Well, that's, that's, that's drug is, addiction. That's yeah. drug addiction. So around payday, it means that yeah. she's coming off the drugs. Mm-hmm. Sounds more kind of opiate-ish. Yeah. So coming off the drugs and the rest opiate. of the week, she's trying to, trying to get her drug supply. Mm-hmm. So you can't put the cart ahead of the course. Okay. You can't. Put, assume that giving somebody a place to live or mm-hmm. a job is going to magically cure their mental illness. Yeah. It does not work like that. Right, So right. start talking to her very Agreed. directly. Just start going, look, I, mm-hmm. I've noticed that you are you seem uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Are you on something? Are you coming off it? Have you gone to NA meetings? Have you thought about going to 12-step meetings? Let's just kind of show up and here are some resources I've heard about. You can look online and find them. There's tons of resources and get her some help. Yeah. It's good. This is going to blow up, unfortunately. And it's not going to go well. She's going to end up stealing from the work. For I mean, sure. yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's just like kind of a natural progression. I mean, opiates, though, I mean, from my understanding, the hardest to get off, the most prolific. A lot of people who start on opiates eventually end up in heroin, and then yeah. it goes on to fentanyl. Yes. yes, yes, that's what we got. It's a progressive illness. And uh, someone to help me talk about that, my other co host from Midday Live, Mike Catherwood. The great Mike Catherwood. Hi. Hey, hey baby. Hey, buddy. So we were talking about opiate addiction, how hard it is to uh, deal with that. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's uh, really. Can you hear me? I hear you. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you're at a. Wh- where are you? I'm uh, at outdoor ice skating in Santa Monica. Oh, ah, okay. just down the road from me. So yeah, we were talking Sorry, about opiates. I had, and- I, I had to call. I had to break away from my my daughter, the future Nancy Kerrigan, in order to make a call to your very special show. Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank I you. hope I hope Rudy's with you. <laughs> I hope Rudy's with you too. I might want to talk to him a little bit. <laughs> What's that? I hope Rudy's with you too. I, I might want to talk to him a little bit. I mean, he is, but I'm I'm in a really I'm in a really tough environment to be breaking out some Rudy. You know, he's uh, I'm, I got him I got him all zipped I got him all zipped up right now because there's a lot of kids around. But he could he knows how to mind his p's and q's, doesn't he? He can behave himself. He's he's not that out of control. I'll, I'll see. I'm sure I'm sure he can. I'll, I'm I'll, I'll warn him that he has to be well behaved. All right, all right. Hey, Rudy. Rudy? Yeah. I get, oh, you want to talk to him right now? I want to okay. talk to him for a second. I'll get you in, I'll get you in t- good time. <laughs> Rudy, come, what's up, man? Hey, hey, what's up, dog? Hey, hey. I hear you're like, um, like uh, retiring or some shit like that. Yeah, we're, watch your language. You're around a bunch of kids, all right? <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, whatever, dog. You know, half of them are mine, so shut up. <laughs> so, 
So, Rudy, yeah, we're going to end KBC. Mike left, and things have up in the same sense. Man, I understand, like, um, you know, he likes to pretend like he's not important, but, like, he holds things together. So a lot of times when he leaves, you know, things, they fall apart. That's what happened. He sold me a car one time, and it blew up. Yeah, <laughs> that happened. He did this. He did the same thing with Loveline, did it with KBC. Everything he touches, he, he makes magic, and then he leaves, and it's all it's all over. <laughs> I feel I feel like he's got like a long record of like you know leaving you high and dry you know like he left two radio shows to like yeah. just let you you know yeah let just me... like uh, flail around in the wind or whatever I know we usually have a talk with that boy but uh, how are you how are your kids how's uh, them up. how's sad how's sad girl oh uh, you know she's good dog you know like uh, she's recovering from the the you know the whole leg incident the amputation right. you know like she didn't get a good like uh, doctor the surgeon to do it so. You know, like it was, uh, we took her down to Mexico to get that amputation. Right. So there's like, you know, they did it with like zippers and screwdrivers and stuff, you know. How about, how about her, uh, her prosthetic leg? What, what's she working with now? Right now, like, um, it's leather. You know what I'm saying, Doc? We got it from my uncle's ranch in Juarez, Doc. It's, uh, yeah. you know, the Panocha Grande. The Panocha Grande, and, yeah. like, um, it's pretty tight. It's got, like, it's got, like, spurs on it and, like, you know. That's some, cool. A little some, silver, like, some, silver Mary, some silver down the, some silver down the side stuff, of it, stuff, right? Like, some Raider stuff. Raiders. Well, that's all the silver, right? Made, like, Raiders helmets? Yeah, yeah, like, but it's like, uh, it's like a bedazzle, dog. You know, yeah, like yeah. Raider helmet, yeah, like yeah. a bedazzler. So, so, Rudy, you're going to be going to Las Vegas? See some? La- they're going to have a fast train to Las Vegas. I thought of you when I heard of that. You going to be going seeing some Raiders games in Vegas? Yeah, but I ain't taking no train full. You know, my <laughs> friend's got a like a Chevy, uh, like a minivan, dog. Yeah. You know, and like I like to just take my time and blaze. Right. You know, maybe drop a little acid full. Okay. Because by the time I get to Pacoima, I'm uh, you know like. Uh, by the time I'm like by Coachella, dog, I'm out. Yeah, yeah, I get that. So back to Sad Girl. So his wife, Sad Girl, um, had a meth problem. Well, she didn't have a meth problem. She had a weight problem, and it made Rudy feel bad. So we started putting meth in her horchata, and she developed she developed a, she developed That's a right, boy. like all her food too. All her food, the meth, and then what happened? Then, like you know, she lost 135 pounds, and you know, also I felt like I was, you know, mission accomplished. You know what I'm saying, dog? Mm-hmm. Dude, but much like, less than by proxy will do that. to go a little crazy. Well, what, what, what was that? <laughs> she was saying Munchausen by proxy. Don't don't worry, Rudy. Uh, that's a lot of words, dog. That's a lot of <laughs> syllables. That's a little bit out of my pay my pay scale, dog. You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying, man. And so tell me, tell tell okay what happened to when she got too much too much meth in the in the, in the huevos. Well, she she started like you know like freaking out and she stabbed my aunt you know for no reason she said she was the devil but it was just my aunt, my tia you know she stabbed her and then like next thing you know she kept saying there was bugs in her legs i'm like there's no bugs in her legs why not and but she just she wouldn't believe me she kept thinking there was bugs there so she chopped her leg off my, and you know i mean i try to look at the bright <laughs> side of things you know like yeah she chopped her leg off but that's another 40 pounds right there you yeah, know yeah. i mean so, that's the way to do it <laughs> So Rudy, uh, let, lining. so Rudy, good to talk to you, man. Go back to the ice skating. Let me get Mike back, okay? All right, folks. All right, man. Good, uh, keep your head up, talk. All right, buddy. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, Mike. Hello. So Rudy, Rudy was in. Uh, see, was he, he was, he? Was, he was good. He? Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm glad he was well behaved. Yeah, he was well. I'm not well behaved, but he was. He was in reg, his routine form. Just he didn't go crazy on us, so. So uh, you're ice skating with right. your daughter there in Santa Monica. What else is she into? You guys got another kid? Uh, uh, I mm, uh, I'd like to, but it's just it's tough. It's really tough. I don't know. I mean, like, there's so many factors that you know make it really difficult. You can't just decide one day to have a kid because you know my wife. You know my wife's an actress and right. she doesn't have a, a stable gig right now, and she's lucky enough to to work a lot, but she doesn't have. Uh, a contract job, so we don't know when she can be back. Right, right. And that, you know, that takes a lot of planning. And she's, you know, we're getting to an age where that might never happen again. But we're seriously exploring adoption. Oh wow! Um, you know, and, sure. and that, yeah. that's, a, I mean, that's a really, really reasonable, viable option. Interesting. So Bianca Kylik, I, I don't know, Caleb, if you can get Bianca's picture up, is uh, Mike's wife. And Mike, so tell people where they can find you. Where? What are you doing now? Are you up with? What, tell us about Jason. What's going on? I'm doing the High and Dry podcast. 
uh, with my man, Jason Ellis, and his beautiful wife, Katie. And uh, it's really starting to shape up to be something something special. I mean, I honestly, I, I knew getting together with Jason, we'd make an entertaining show. I, I never had one doubt in my mind that that would be um, that would be the case. But with Jason now really embracing his bisexuality and being a lot more open about his trauma, um, the show's become something of a, of a real safe place for so many people out there. And it's really heartwarming to see a lot of the DMs and the tweets and the emails that I get, but man, the stuff Jason gets, it's really heartwarming to see like, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I'm, in, I'm into moto. I'm into MMA and I live in Oklahoma city and I'm just so scared cause I'm gay and I can't come out and I never had anybody to look up to. And you're like such an inspiration to me, Jason. And you know, stuff like that. Like, like I said, it's, it, accidentally shaped up to be something really kind nice. of important and special. So uh, hang on, Susan, the, isn't Jason the high and drive podcast? Yeah. So Jason's coming up here in a couple of weeks, like January 5th. Why don't you either call in or show up for that? Yeah. Oh, you set it up. Okay. Forget Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> but at least call in. All right. But listen, man, and how do they find that show? Uh, the, it's called high and dry spelled normally. And, uh, it's available everywhere. Podcasts are available. And also I'm at Mike Catherwood on every outlet there is but also at Kulo breaker if you want to follow your boy rudy because he's he's tweeting all and and uh instagramming a lot of high quality stuff <laughs> at Kulo breaker okay yeah. at Kulo breaker all right man right, talk to you right. soon all right buddy yeah. thanks for calling all right love you bye all right bye bye mike so yeah rudy is um one of my favorites i was about to say i need to spend like weekends with him just being in his presence weekends with rudy <laughs> just hide under the table and watch it is a rich tapestry <laughs> of los angeles culture uh all right let's uh let's get some more calls here we got a few more minutes up so uh, that was such nice spin what what's that producer you can do your calls now it'll be a really good time oh that's what i'm doing stretch. That's so what as long I'm doing. as you'd like uh, okay here we go uh mm, ooh. All right, this is just a medical question. It's an easy one. Uh, Ryan, go ahead. Hey, hey Dr. Ryan. Drew, you live, man. You live. Thanks for hearing me. What do you know about chemo brain? I know it's very common. Uh, I've seen it a lot. I've seen it with multiple different kinds of chemo. It's usually the chemos for solid tumor, like colon or lung, that I typically see this, breast. And... It's very disturbing to people, and it usually gets a lot better. So how do you help? I, I, and I'm talking about my 78-year-old mother who's been dealing with cancer for, for 20 years now, but how do I help her progress and live while dealing with uh, what seems to be an alternate reality when my brother and I try and help her with her daily all right. Uh, it's just her daily uh, thing. You know okay. what I mean? Yes, yes, I know. So so here are some simple guidelines. Make sure she has seen a neurologist so we're clear that that's what it is. It is related to the chemo and not the chemo plus something else that may or may not have treatment, number one. Number two. Of course. Yeah, number two is in-home supportive services. There's lots of stuff available um, geriatric networks most hospitals have have connection with where she can get access to resources and caretakers and services that you may not be aware of so take advantage of that it's very hard to do it on your own it needs often a lot of people helping uh number three well thankfully thankfully she, uh, oh, i'm sorry thankfully she lives in an, a, in an area that has a great uh, network of care Great. And and we're doing our best, but it seems that any time we try to offer help, it's, it's faced with great resistance. Yeah, and I just don't know how to I, help her. Yeah. better. Uh, the the one thing this is going to sound not being there, not knowing her, not knowing you. This is going to sound a little bit crass, but let me just sort of say it. Don't spend a lot of top time talking. Just get in there and help. So just be there, be helpful, right. put help in place. Don't don't get into conversations about it. Just do what is appropriate to keep her safe. Period. End of story. Make sense. So uh, the uh, are are there psychiatric 
uh, treatments that you uh, recognize? No, it's, uh, it's I mean, it, we, there we are. Started, uh, we started olanzapine yeah. just, just a couple of days ago. Is that Yeah, I mean, olanzapine, or? it's not bad, but it is not totally safe. Uh, there are studies that show use of olanzapine, while it might improve some of the symptoms, it can have some dangerous associations that people are worried about. So there are geriatric specialized psychiatrists, and it's sort of that what you should take advantage of there. But, you know, it, it's – this is really hard to do well. It's really hard when people are in sort of this intermediate state, when they're not fully incapacitated. They have some of their faculties that might be improving. It's it's the most frustrating part of all. And they want their independence and their autonomy. And that you, what you have to do is just – Rely on the people that create in-home supportive services and just put them in place. Like get get proper evaluations and do that. I was going to say, I mean, how have you noticed the rates of kind of comorbidities with when you've got a physical ailment and then the mental ailment comes in? How has that changed over the course of your career? Because from all of my research, mm -hmm. it used to be either you kind of developed a mental disorder or you or you developed a physical health disorder and then... We dealt with it. Now all of the research seems to be on how do you deal with both at the right. same time. I, I don't I, I think part of that is the result of the fact that we are aging mm -hmm. so much. And mm -hmm. so as you age, necessarily medical conditions are gonna have more neurologic effects. Mm -hmm. They're also gonna have psychiatric effects. And this is the part that people are mostly ignorant of. So when I first got working in a psychiatric hospital in nineteen eighty five, my job was to figure out the medical piece mm -hmm. it was is there psychiatric syndrome because of a medical problem is there psychiatric syndrome making the me any medical problems worse are the psychiatric medications causing medical problems mm -hmm. or making medical problems worse <laughs> it's a very complicated interrelationship yes. that has been largely ignored mm -hmm. to your point uh, and as you age it gets that much more complicated that much more intense so there's the neurologic and there's the psychiatric, and we do very little to really in an integrative and systematic way evaluate all that stuff. I mean, I was going to ask, how do you feel about the rates of prescriptions? Because we overprescribe. Yeah. We, well, what's weird about our country is we overprescribe and we underprescribe. Oh. Yes. We, okay. We overprescribe in certain environments with certain conditions, mm -hmm. and then underprescribed in other areas with other conditions. God, it's almost yeah. as if like. These uh, these places where there are over prescriptions, like there might be money involved in, there's money involved uh, in those and, systems. And, yeah, there's money involved, and there's no um, but there's it. also over reliance. On, that's not not yes, there's money involved, yeah. but also there's over reliance on the medical system yeah. for being able to solve problems. That's where we, my kind of work comes in. Yeah, people like which came first though the yeah. the over prescription that created right. a dependence or mm, did the many. over yeah. It's 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 both it's both culpable, but but I will tell you the one common thread that you're sort of zeroing in on, mm -hmm. which I like talking about, is that in this country, we have decided that we will not tolerate ordinary misery. Ordinary misery is a part of life. Oh, completely. And, and it's actually it's what we did wrong in our child rearing in the last twenty years or mm -hmm. so is letting kids fail and be miserable, so they mm -hmm. develop grit and problem solving skills. We've decided that ordinary misery is completely anathema and we will not have it. Yeah. And that's where the overutilization of the medical system gets kicked in. Does that I make can, sense? Yeah, I can see that. I've uh, I've definitely observed that. Well, I, I had like a very different upbringing, I think, to a lot of people my age in that I was constantly either surrounded by adults or children my age who didn't speak my language because I got to travel. Well, like, well, we got to travel a lot as a family. Yeah. Um, and then when I go back to school, obviously, I had like a very different lived experience. So I would surround myself with kids that had a similar kind of thing, like very... Mm -hmm. Very much that level. And At least then, you could find that in Europe. You couldn't even find that here. I, I mean, think. I moved out here. I ha I do have friends in my demographic. I find it almost impossible to date anyone within like 10 like they have to be at least 10 years older than me otherwise i'm just like i just can't like yes i've had depression guess what like sometimes i just want to die it sounds it sounds like more fun than being alive and people tell me i'm crazy for thinking that which i don't think is true i think a lot of people go yeah. through that idea of like oh god this is absolutely fucking bollocks i just don't want to do it anymore and uh yeah that's where those stigmas come in and then everyone my age now goes to therapy and Depends on their fucking I, horoscope. I, <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> My daughter lives in Brooklyn. That's all everybody talks about there. But 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 I'm a little surprised to hear you say that depression is not something that people understand and embrace and can sort of 
deal with. That's that's really surprising to me. It might. Just, I thought that was at least one thing we had right with this with your age group. I it? think maybe I I don't know. I again maybe or maybe it's the way you just, talk about it, scare men. Oh my men god, off, I absolutely terrify. Oh no, I terrify yeah. my friends with the way that I talk about it because I have to make a joke out of it. Yeah, like I think that there's like there's this very British approach to uh, sad things because everything is sad in Britain. Um, where we it's have to, yeah, it's the weather, you know, it's, it, <laughs> oh God, yeah, it's the weather, it's the lack of cannabis legalization. Um, but n- to a certain extent, I think my generation have a far more open mind towards these mm-hmm, things. Mm-hmm. Like, so my depression got to such a point earlier this year that my two best friends had to take me out to the desert to have the kind of come to Jesus conversation with me of, you need to get your shit together or you're actually going to die from this. And had I not had those two people who I trusted and who knew me well enough to come in and say, let's get you the fuck out of here and get you the help you need, because it's not coming from anywhere else. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't be here today. And I, I worry about the you know, hundreds of thousands of people on our street who don't have anyone that will come in and do that for them and who actually have people who will come in and... Do the opposite. Yeah. En- enable, the, enable the illness. Enable it, make money from it, uh-huh. uh, make it even worse than it already was. Like the number of people, like women in particular and children who end up on the streets, the rates of human and child trafficking crazy. that's like on the rise as well. Yeah, it's crazy. And it starts, I mean, for a lot of people, it starts with that first kind of, oh God, I feel sad. And I, I think that if I'd been from America and if I'd been born and raised here, there is a huge motivation within my like age demographic to just completely drop out of society in that way. Like I can see how people my age really would just, just because be of, like, because of a, fuck this shit, I'm done. Be, because of a common symptom, particularly for your age. Well, like I think, so this is pretty much what my book has now become about. I mean- My generation, our first memory, really, that we can all collectively say that we have is of 9-11. We went from 9-11 into the war on terror, which, like, massively started to polarize us against other racial groups, which is a huge issue in the UK as well, because we have such a huge integrated Islamic community. Most of my school was Islam, and then I was being, like, you know, I go home and watch the news and being told to hate this religion, and yeah, I go to school and all my friends aren't this religion. Hmm. So we would start to get polarized against each other. Then social media comes in and makes it so much easier. And I usually use the C word in this, but I'm not because this live stream is my first one. But we come in and we're just such fuckers to one another on social media. And it makes it so much easier to be a bastard. And then you throw in things like therapy. You throw in things like this over-dependency on like, uh, things like yeah, a horoscope. Horoscopes. We self-isolate because we think it's the right thing to do because all of our friends are going to therapy all of our friends are depending on their horoscopes when really we need to just be sitting in a room together having a conversation about how shitty things are and coming up with informed solutions like i know that i'm a doing this now i'm a huge hypocrite like we all just sit and prevaricate about these solutions but until we break down the stigmas and start actually accepting what's normal and saying it's it's normal to be depressed it's normal to not like society right now it's a terrifying place i mean you know uh, carol who was on here earlier she and i like we've talked about this before because she's like she's just such a brilliant mind on this subject but when women like i'm scared to go out and walk down the street on my own other women are scared to go outside and walk down the street on their own after a while these things kind of compound you get scared you've got a society that doesn't really look like it's kind of going anywhere you've got things like climate change you go to your device which is like permanently attached to like everyone now and all that's coming through there is fear hate Mm. i mean what the fuck else are we supposed to do at this point (laughs) like i I would i would argue and maybe this is my my age here is that we tend to solve these things but we don't know that yet. Know. We haven't experienced this. And I talk about this but, but in I don't my know what, book. But I don't know what kind of crisis you have to go through before you do. Well, the other That's thing, the, the other difference I kind of came up with or discovered between, you know, kind of the millennial and say the, the baby boomer and the Gen X generation. Yeah. I know you just easily say well, to you, me, write that, okay, boomer. <laughs> like, okay. okay, boomer. Yeah, yeah. But like you guys had a hell of a lot of time before all the shit started to kick in. Before, sort like you, you guys knew that the world was a good place. No, in- we we had bomb 
rehearsals every two weeks. We had to go in the basement of the school with an air raid siren went off. We had to hang over it because because there was going and in the eighties there was going to be a nuclear attack. We all had to watch a TV show called The Day After, mm -hmm. which was to tell us what it was going to be like the day after the nuclear attack we were going to have. We were just accepting of nuclear holocaust. So you were accepting that it was that someone in a room somewhere was going to press the button and it's game over. That our government was going to misbehave in such a way that something bad happened. Okay. Constantly, constantly hanging over us. I mean, think about a second grader going downstairs and putting your hands over your head and ducking mm -hmm. and sitting there for an hour while the air raid sirens went as a rehearsal for when we get our nuclear attack. <laughs> you didn't know we did that? I mean, I'm, I, I, I can get it. I understand. That's we don't we have did. drills like that in the right. day. But like, we have kids going through that with like active shooters. And I hate to, you know diminish what you went through no, you're but right. people actually go in and shoot up schools right. so like my generation not that i'm trying to compare because you know you can't it's two completely different contexts but the difference being is that the shit that we're scared of actually fucking happens and well, like we we talked about this a little bit on your show to do with climate change yeah. and um you mentioned that uh one of your friends is like very very confident that we're going to be able to deal with it and he's an excellent thought leader on this Millennials need to see the action. Yeah, yeah. Like until we see the the quote grown ups are doing something to deal with these crises. Yeah, I get that. We don't think we have a future. Yeah. Like we don't have healthcare. We don't have uh, proper wealth. We have wealth inequality, uh, which is de a definite thing. Um, well, I get it. And yeah, I get it. And and we need to we need that. we need to have some successes here in changing things. But I think we can deal with a lot of this by just talking to one another. Like I think if more generations, like intergenerational conversations and uh, networks, I mean, just 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 have the conversation, understand one another's like difference in the lived experience. But, but I oh yes for sure. But but I do agree with you that you need to see some things change. Yes, I completely agree yes. with that. We need to see the action. Because right now okay. all we're watching is this bloody genocide. Here is uh, Joe. Joe, go ahead. <coughs> Joe. Hello? Hey, Joe. Hello? Hey. Hi. Hey, Dr. Drew, thank you so much for taking my call. You bet. Hey, I wanted to thank you, first of all. I'm coming up on six years sober, and uh, I wouldn't have gotten there uh, as soon without your uh, nudging that the VH1 shows you did uh, really nudged me in the right direction. I, I thank you so much for being and part of my sobriety. I'm glad. That's why we did them. So glad. Hey, so uh, someone who was very important to me in my early sobriety uh, was a girl that I kind of dated, and we used to drink and uh, do coke and we party and whatever and have a good time. When she found out that I was getting serious about sobriety, uh, she was right there for me. Uh, she went to meetings with me hmm. and uh, was a great friend. I haven't heard from her for about the past year. Uh, and I moved to I moved to Los Angeles uh, about six months after getting sober, so we haven't seen each other for a while. But uh, the last time I talked to her uh, was very strange. She said she said that she had um, moved to Alaska and people were after her, and the government was doing experiments on her. And she had this total. I, mean, I didn't even recognize her. It was very scary. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a uh, is that delusion or schizophrenia or That's drug you can do or so what? I'm right. very afraid for her. Okay, so she's delusional. How old is she? Uh, she's 38. Okay, schizophrenia doesn't come on age 38. You said she was on some medication. Do you know what that medication was for? No, I don't know if she was on medication or not. I thought you said something about her not taking medication. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. No, I, okay. I don't know if any, uh, okay, <clears throat> any medication. I know she used to drink and, and, and right. party and stuff. I don't think she's ever been on in, on any kind of a All right. medication. So it, the, the reason I was asking that was if she was on some sort of antipsychotic medication before from something that happened in her 20s, that would make sense as a major mental illness. But if she's developing psychotic... I don't think so. Yeah. So she's developing psychotic symptoms in her late 30s, that's drugs. And so the, the one that, the, you know, you need to understand the difference between a cocaine psychosis and an amphetamine psychosis. So cocaine psychosis is usually with crack, and it's rapidly developing. It develops over a few days, and it's a, always a preoccupation with uniformed officers. People in uniforms are outside coming to get me, okay? Police, SWAT, you know, okay. some, somebody in a uniform is out there and coming in. With meth, it's much more elaborate, much more bizarre, 
and always involves preoccupations with people around them, mm -hmm. friends, neighbors, coworkers, that kind of thing. And this sounds more like that. And the delusions can be really wild and they're very fixed and they can continue even for m months after you stop doing the math. Now, now she is convinced that there's an online community of these people. I don't know if you've heard of this, but I listen to some other podcasts and stuff. The people that think that they're, quote, targeted individuals, yes. that the government is running experiments. You're familiar with this? Yes. It, it, it's very scary. I mean, I mean is, is that, I mean, is she mentally ill or is she on drugs? Because I know people can come back from drugs, but it's, it sounds it's more, me it a sounds lot. more like meth more than anything else. Now, I don't know. I mean, a lot of things can cause these symptoms, but somebody getting it in her late 30s who used to party, just putting it all together, it sort of sounds meth-esque. It may not be. There may be other things, even you know, brain tumors, thyroid conditions, other things can cause this as well. So it is important that she get to some help. And her being reinforced in her delusions by an online community is not helping her. Sure. So what, what can I do to help her? It's rough, man. If you're not in the vicinity where she is, it, it's usually they go to a place where they start getting kind of aggressive and somebody kind of hauls them in. That's typically what happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, she moved, you know, like I said, she moved from the Pacific Northwest to Alaska to live with some friends who I've never heard of. And um, I, I'm very worried for her. I mean, yeah. I don't think well, like maybe, maybe just bring from... bring that up and sort of gently don't don't walk on eggshells around her, but just gently bring up. Have you seen a doctor about it? Have you seen anybody taking care of you? I'm worried about you, and uh, see if you can urge her into some kind of medical care so she can at least get an evaluation, so they can figure out what this is. The kind of distance you're at from her is just it's just too much, too much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the call, man. Uh, my goodness, we have lots of great calls here. Oh. <laughs> uh. Let's try this. Uh, this is um, Abigail from Canada. Hi, Abigail. Hi. Hi, Dr. Drew. How are you? I'm good. What's going on? Hello. Hi there. Can you hear us? Wow. I'm so excited to speak with you. Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear. Hello. We hear you. Okay. You're not, you're not, you're not hearing us, but we're hearing you. Okay. And, and by the way, let me just say, I just want to say something, Abigail, before you go on. I, sure. I know there's a little bit of a delay here. That's what's screwing us up. But mm -hmm. I also know there was some drop off in the streaming, and I apologize to people if they've seen this dropping off. Uh, there, the actual uh, video download will be available, and it's complete, and the podcast will be complete. So none of that dropping is occurring in what we're recording. It just was something to do with our internet here. So, so Abigail, what's going on? Okay. I'm inquiring about alternative treatments, um, medication assisted treatments, medical assisted detoxification for alcohol and drug addiction. Basically the conditions, alcohol use disorder, concomitant alcohol use disorder, long-standing PTSD, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. all from a veteran, childhood trauma, including kidnapping, abuse, witnessing abuse, uh, family history, alcoholism, depression. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. It's a lot. So I'm wondering what al alternative treatments are available Alternatives, and he's been through traditional treatment? Well, um, my brother, who's a veteran, has, has been um, in rehab on two, well, two occasions at one particular center and is to go back to a veterans program um, in the new year. And he's been in other rehabs. Um, you know, He's not getting better. So, you know, we're at this point where we're a little, you know, desperate yeah. for help. Does he want help? Yes. He's very anxious to go back, especially into the veterans program in the new year. Okay. Um, so it's not, it's not a fight. Like when, when 
he was younger. Mm-hmm. You know, it was always a struggle in the past. Right. But, you know, All right. so, he's willing. Right. So that's great. Yeah. That That's a prognostically much, much better situation. It seems like it's the psychiatric symptoms that are confounding things, which is often the case. Uh, the way I would approach something like this is look at it as a one to two year horizon. This is not something he's going to go into for a few weeks and there's a magic alternative treatment out there for him. So the, you got to think of the structure. I mean, he's been sick his whole life. And so you have to have structure for him yeah. of the, of a one to two year duration. So he's got to be living in a halfway house or a therapeutic living environment of some type for an extended period of time. The other key ingredient, well, two key ingredients. He needs trauma-informed care, whether it's EMDR or some sort of actual trauma, of specific trauma therapies where people really know what they're doing with that. Number three, he has to be in a veterans group. That being in a group with men and women like him that have been through what he's been through, there's something about that that is absolutely necessary in recovering from this. People feel as though, veterans feel as though non-veterans, non-combat veterans particularly, cannot understand what it's like unless somebody's been through it and they need that in order to connect with them and then finally whatever psychiatric symptoms he's having needs to be aggressively treated particularly in the short term aggressively treated sorry i got not, that's about all i got and i know it's a lot to, to think about and a lot to fulfill um and uh, i just wish you the best with it but, but think of it as a long-term proposition not something that's going to get better in a few weeks or even a few months how do you feel about things like if 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 an individual has all, all of the of other care around them? How what is your perspective on things like ayahuasca, LSD, things like that? Uh, I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm, mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of research on it. I I have I'm going to get a guy on this show actually that's a, a shaman that's been oh, doing. He cool. says he's done forty thousand uh, sort of plant informed care with trauma, mm-hmm. and he claims great outcomes. The research isn't there for me to go, you got to go do that, yeah. unfortunately. But the 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 particularly for trauma, it looks mm-hmm. like there's something there. That's so mm-hmm. interesting. Because I, I, I know a little bit about it in yeah. regards to getting over drug addiction, like cleansing okay, the, the system. The, the, the drug like addiction the part, depression. yeah, the drug addiction part, I know the Ibogaine particularly is very popular. I've seen... L- you didn't I, know that? I thought Ibogaine was something that was made up by Hunter S. Thompson back in the day. No, to no, like, Ibogaine. Yeah. People would go, my patients would go down to Mexico and get it all the time because it was going to cure drug addiction. There's, there are places that do that down there. And then ayahuasca oh. can do it too. Yeah, and yeah. Being used. Similar, <laughs> there's similar things, DMT essentially. And, and I've seen it work when it's a dependent, non-addicted person. Mm-hmm. So you can, in other words, let me be clear about this. You can get strung out on opiates, look like a drug addict, behave like a drug addict, but not be a drug addict the way I think about drug addicts. <laughs> In other words, you don't have the genetic disorder. Mm-hmm. You don't want to keep using after you've stopped. Mm-hmm. Those severely drug-dependent people do seem to be helped by this stuff. Okay. A- addicts sometimes are helped. My concern is when I've seen it help, it only I've only seen it help for six months, mm-hmm. but that's not nothing. It's something, so it's doing something. Yeah. And I've seen some personality changes. And that always, when the person is changed by a drug, I always get very, very worried. I, the psychiatric literature and, and the psychedelic literature has defended changes. That's why how we got lobotomies. Because people went, well, they were much nicer after lobotomies. I mean, when, you, when the people change as a result of the treatment, mm-hmm. I, I take issue with it. It's changing the personhood. Yeah. Now I'm gravely concerned. Okay. So that's been my concern. What kind of changes? Just not the same person. But what does and that? Because like I would say, like, like vague and nicer, <laughs> and uh, just clearly changed. Not not in the sense psychologically changed. Okay. Like biologically changed. Not responding as quickly. and Not as engaging. Not oh, as, so like like just different. Okay, I and, I, and, I think and, you're trying not to use certain words here, maybe. Well, no, because it's because I've not seen it tested formally, and it's mm-hmm. always do- they were always doing it on the DL, and I couldn't really get the before and after yeah. formally at- assessed and 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 I'm sure people can do it without having that effect. Mm-hmm. I just don't know who and for how much and what dosing and what and that's why I want to get this guy in here that mm-hmm. does claim to be an expert in all this and yeah. see he, could, he he would be able to maybe talk about it more clearly. One time so, I went fishing in Croatia with uh, an ex-boyfriend and his family. As everyone does. As everyone <laughs> does. As everyone does. Um, I mean, it's Europe. It's like, tw- it used to be 20 quid to fly to Croatia. But um, uh, I guess uh, we went fishing, caught these uh, little sea bream. I don't I don't know exactly what these bream. bream fed off, but I guess it was some kind of al- oh, algae. We're in America. 
algae, not algae, uh, that had some super duper active component in it that was similar to DMT. Oh, interesting. So his whole family, they're all like well over six. Even his mother was over six foot. Oof. And uh, so we eat like a couple of these fish. It's, you know, Did no you big know deal. Did you know this was going to happen? Oh, no. no. <laughs> so I walk out of their apartment. We're just going to go like wander around Rieja for a couple of hours. And I get just like a couple of steps outside the door and I was like I'm gonna die from this I'm gonna die from this I'm gonna die from and then he went and did all of the research to find out what it was and I was just kind of lying in bed like this for about a day and uh that put me off doing there is another fish those. disease called I'm blanking the name of it but it's it's a it's a neurotoxin oh is that the one where you can't drink anymore no oh. it's not that it's where you get sort of paralyzed and nausea and that but but I don't know about the psychiatric oh part. I was oh no I was Were you like I was hallucinating oh my yeah. goodness it That's was so interesting I mean it's not like pink elephants but it's like yeah. you know kind of when you do acid you see like the corners of the room move and what have you it wow. was more like that yeah it was fantastic yeah it was great so if you want to go party you go to Croatia just did you want to stop doing drugs after that I so I've never been that cool mm -hmm. like i mean growing up in europe you're always kind of exposed to these things like we have a really healthy party life and attitude <laughs> and culture but i was always the first person to leave the party i was you know Let's call that a lightweight yeah you're lightweight. i used to be able to sink like eight pints and like debate anyone and you know i can I can still drink like a Brit, but no, I was always too much of a kind of stoner, easy rider type. Let's all just love each other, guys. Like, you know, you can't do the work. When what changed? Maybe it was that, that fish episode. Probably. Maybe yeah. That. yeah. Maybe I went through a personality change. <laughs> <laughs> guys, we've got to wrap this up. There are so many great calls here. We will try to keep you, keep them for next time. Is we that? We, we have a video. We have a video. Oh, we have a video. I think it's. Oh no! One oh yeah, the we have the, our art our art installment. <laughs> it's worth uh, two hundred fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and we have an art installment here. Uh, I I I'm I'm maybe somebody will have the the uh, what do they call it the what did that guy call it when he ate the banana the living art uh, sort of expression. You won't eat the banana. Okay, <laughs> the Miss Producer is coming. Performance <laughs> art. The performance art of eating artist eating banana, but the producer is <laughs> on a keto diet. So let's watch this video and see who this is from. Hey, Dr. Drew, it's Leanne. Um, I am at home getting ready to leave for the Nutcracker. Um, we're taking the kids today, and that's why I couldn't be in the studio with you. Um, but I'm making this little video to say it's been an incredible experience this last year with you hosting on KBC. I think I've told you multiple times that sitting across the mic from you was such a a wonderful learning experience for me. I felt like I was in college or just somewhere where it was all about higher learning and getting educated and learning what the facts and the data were. And I, you know, I can't thank you enough. It's been a real honor. It's been a privilege. I know our relationship goes back to almost 20 years now when I Crazy. first um, went on K-Rock and Loveline with you and Adam Carolla as a guest when I was doing the Best Damn Sports Show. And we've been friends ever since. I did your podcast, I remember, and that's when I told you I was such a huge fan of your HLN TV show, Dr. Drew on Call. Mm. And you said, hey, why don't you come on and be a guest on there? And uh, that was a, a few years of fun to being a part of that. So... We've had a long relationship. We've done a lot of different things. I don't think this is the end, even though this chapter is closing. There's a lot of different forums out there that we can continue our fight, not only for the people of Los Angeles, but all over this country. You are doing great work. You care about people and you care about issues. And I'm telling you, drdrew2020.com. <laughs> I'm gonna get that domain name. You have to run for office. We need you. Everyone needs you. And I think mm -hmm. you're the man that can help turn the ship around in Los Angeles and, and make a difference in California. So I will be there to support you. Um, I love you. I love Sue. I love the kids. Um, I know this isn't the end, but I will finish with this. Help us, Dr. Drew Pensky. <laughs> you're our only hope. You have to run for office. All right. Have a great show. Mwah. Oh, Leanne, so help Obi-Wan. <laughs> Leanne, thank you. That was very, very sweet. And it was a, the privilege was mine. I, you were great. We, we talked to Mike and Lauren today, too. And it's just this whole experience has been very, very positive. So 
I hope we do more stuff in the future. Yeah. So look what you've been exposed to. I know. I feel so lucky to have been able to come on the show. I know. We didn't know. That was, like the, that was like the day or the day before we found out. Oh, my god. I gosh. think so. Maybe a few days before. Yeah. So you've yeah. got about 12 million other shows that are going to be coming so out. So we're going to so figure something good. else out. We'll yeah. keep it going. And yeah. um, I feel bad all these people are waiting on hold and we're not going to get to them. And I apologize to you guys Aww. that we did not get to. We'll, yeah, call back next time. We'll put you out the put the blast out at drdrew.tv. Kay, where can people find you? Uh, ksmythe.com. Just Google ksmythe. S M Y T H E. T H E. Not Smith. Smythe. Thanks, Smythe thanks parents, for that one. <laughs> so, meaning <laughs> having to every time, every time at every roll call and every. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's K K A Y. There's no T. <laughs> or E. Oh, my God. Yeah. But, um,. That's, yeah, that's it. Let it go, okay. Let it go. Let it go. It's all good. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate Thank it. Really you a so privilege. Much for and uh, me. congratulations in all you're doing. And I hope you do a lot more because I think it can make a big difference. So. Oh, thank you. And, well, um, We'll talk to you more. We'll yeah, get more stuff going. So. That'll be great. Thank you so much for having and me. Thank you guys for calling and watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Hey, Dr. Drew here. And this is just a reminder that the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care or medical evaluation. This is purely for entertainment and education. We hope you learned something, but see your doctor, get proper medical care.